It's time for Mac Break Weekly. This is a big news week. Thank goodness Renee Ritchie, Andy Anako, and Lori Giller here. Phil Schiller takes a new job. It's the final Intel iMac, or is it? And we'll talk about why Apple suspended Charlie Monroe's developer account, or did they? It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. MacBreak Weekly comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 725, recorded Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. The last great Mac. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Taylor Store. Taylor Store makes high quality clothing that's fully customizable by you. From the basic essentials to the most high end details, Taylor Store has you covered. Get 20% off plus free shipping with every purchase through October 31st at taylorstore.com slash twit. Use the code twit. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses like ours connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. And boy, there's going to be so much news today. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a long time to talk. Fortunately, we got the best in biz here. Rene Ritchie from uh, his YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Rene Ritchie. He's a regular contributor to I'm More and other magazines. Hello, Renee. Hello, Leo. I, can I become a, a Twit uh, fellow? Yes, I'm <laughs> promoting you to Twit fellow at Jolly Good. Excellent. You're in the Jolly Good. I'll be in charge Good. of sitting here and commenting. <laughs> we'll explain what that's all about in a second. Andy Anako's here from WGBH, Boston Public Radio, and parts Hello. north. Hello, Andrew. You get a little storm, like a I think, right about now, yeah? Yeah, the, the trees are doing kind of like this. And I've already gotten three warnings, three like alerts on my phone, including from the power company saying, Hi, if you've got anything that you can burn for power, you might want to start stuff. All, wow. all that all that toilet paper you bought that didn't use, you might want to start thinking <laughs> yeah. about using that for yeah. generate electricity. Well, stay, oh, well, stay safe and dry. Also with us from imore.com. Where she is the managing editor, it's Lori Gill. Hello, Lori Gill. I would like to join the fellowship of the ring, please. <laughs> <laughs> She's also a fellowship of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, all of that comes from an announcement early this morning that Phil Schiller is moving upstairs. Phil, of course, who was in charge of marketing in Apple for how long? Ever. 20-something years? One he was, he was with Apple for 20 something. He's, he's been he's been mm -hmm. in marketing for like 27 years. He's head of marketing for I want to say 14, 15. I can't I can't so long that I can't remember who his predecessor yes. was. He he is he's a fixture. Like there, you think you think about a, a Mount Rushmore of Apple, meaning that these are the four or five <laughs> people that you see at every single keynote that represent like the face of Apple, who know all of the stories uh, deep, deep, deep back into the Steve Jobs era, who also are part of the brain trust that factor into all the decisions. When the fact that he has marketing in his title implies that he's he's yeah. choosing colors for posters. No, he is like deep, 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 like waist deep in every single decision he runs about product. how we're – exactly. Uh, he so uh, has is, a BS a in biology from Boston College. He was at Macromedia in San Francisco. Yes. VP, I didn't realize that. VP of yeah. Product Marketing. Yeah. We must have just cro you know, ba almost crossed paths at that point. Um, at Apple, he has been pretty much, as you say, Andy, part of every major Apple announcement of the past decade and a half. Uh, worked on the format, formation and marketing of iMac, MacBook, MacBook Pro, iPod, Mac OS. He's credited with coming up with the idea for the click wheel interface on the original iPod. He worked uh, as a support uh, supporting role, best, uh, best uh, supporting actor to Steve Jobs' famous keynotes for both <laughs> the iPhone and the iPads. In fact, he like did the Wi-Fi one. The what? Yeah. <laughs> 
He's turn off your laptops. <laughs> <laughs> no, but remember he, he had to jump or something with the with the laptop while Steve was trying to beam him a signal. So like some of those funny. are just so classic. Like they could be a rerun show <laughs> Never on a streaming forget. service. He uh, he would when Jobs was on medical leave, he gave several keynotes keynotes himself, yeah. including Apple's Apple's last keynote at MacWorld in two thousand nine and the WWDC keynote in two thousand nine. Uh, he announced the MacBook. Pro line update, the 3GS, new versions of iLife and iWork, but he's best known for one word, courage. <laughs> and not innovating anymore, my ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both of which didn't age well. Um, no, but I mean, like, the, they're the memories that we live with, Leo. Yeah. They're the moments. Exactly. Unfortunately, you get kind of painted with that uh, brush. He is still at Apple. He will be an Apple fellow. What does that even mean? Oh, thank goodness, Leo, because I, I actually <laughs> looked like it up on was. Wikipedia and I still couldn't figure out how that relates to what Phil Schiller will be doing at Apple. <laughs> yeah. There's no title between senior vice president. Like Apple doesn't have presidents. They don't have anything else. They have a very uh, enigmatic structure. And he's basically going to keep control. So he just kept getting more and more things. If we've noticed over time, like Steve Dowling hasn't been replaced. You know, his job is just being done by others. Angela Ahrens wasn't replaced. Her job is just being done by, yeah, by others. Some people uh, are not at Apple anymore. No, is, is this like true, in, uh, in the TV the show store, Silicon and, Valley where they go up to the roof and they just hang out and have no. lunch because they don't have anything else to do. No, but like <laughs> he had so much on his invested. plate, which is why they promoted <laughs> Jaws to begin with. And now he's gonna he's gonna keep App Store. He's gonna keep the events because the events are gonna be a challenge for the next year still. And Jaws is gonna do all the mar marketing stuff. Yeah. So that's the second yeah. half of this announcement is that uh, the very highly respected Greg Joswiak, who is often called Jaws. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, will now be uh, senior vice president of worldwide marketing, effectively taking Schiller's post. So Phil will continue. This is the quote from the Apple press release: "Continue to lead the App Store and Apple events." Does that mean he's going to lead events, or he's going? I mean, what does that mean? Well, if, if it remains to be seen, but another thing that should be pointed out is that other uh, at Google and other companies, when we see, when we find when there's an announcement about, well, the this senior executive has decided that he wants to uh, pursue lots and lots of additional goals until in addition to his wonderful 20 or 30 year career, and so he's being elevated to a position that is kind of vague and undefined. That often means that they lost so their their product launch supremely failed, and they're being nosed out, or there is another reason. Reason why they are he's being offered a we want we can't you're, you're too big for us to fire you so let's just give you an opportunity to fade out gracefully this is absolutely not that sort of thing so yeah. it, it basically it's it's it, we, it remains to be seen what it means but I bet it means that he's 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 still in the meetings. He's still a part of the email list. He's still part of the Slack channel. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's well, just that he's, he's is, no longer has. Jaws is living like their out. Their problem is you have these. Go Amazing ahead. people like you have Kyan Drantz, who's just been promoted to vice president of iPhone product marketing. And where where do they go? Like they're all working at Apple, but they just don't have titles. And Phil's been working yeah. there a long time. He's got he's got you know money forever, and his family sometimes wants to spend more time with him and the money. Yeah. That's yeah. just how these things work. We'll see. <laughs> we'll just see. I, my guess is he'll still have some stage time, but how much uh, operational yeah. role is another uh, matter. This was but, Mansfield, right? And we yeah. saw this happen too. Because Mansfield got Kyan called back doing, though because nobody yes. could do Bob Mansfield's job. Yeah. <laughs> well, so are you saying that Jaws will start an ill-conceived Apple hot tub secret project? <laughs> the, the amount of aluminum will be too expensive for anyone else to sign for Jeff Williams to sign off on, and then Phil will come be come back and say you fix our outdoor party well, let initiative. Me, let me fill you in on Greg Joswiak, who is now the Apple SVP for worldwide marketing. Uh, he got his start early. He got a degree in uh, a Bachelor of Science in uh, Computer Science in uh, 1986. And even then, they said his nickname, Jaws, was a combination of Steve Jobs and Steve <laughs> Wozniak. He was destined to join okay. Apple. Joined Apple in 86, two years after the Macintosh launched, uh, in Apple's newly formed support organization for the Mac. So he has his roots deep in the Mac. He was running that group within two years. Uh, then he led comms for the Apple Developers Group, so he has a good relationship with developers. I always like to see that 
That's a very important thing at yeah. Apple to understand the the users, but also understand kind of the second most important group of and users. And WWDR reports into him now. I mean, dub, yeah. dub, that's one of, a big part of the marketing organization is worldwide developer relations. That's right. Uh, in 1997, he led product marketing for the new PowerBook line. Eventually, uh, all po portable products. Eventually, all hardware products, including in 2001 the iPod. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the iPhone and the iPad. So he really has been in a marketing role, kind of a product marketing role forever and ever. Yeah. And they're very different than a lot of marketing people. Because in my old job, when I was in product marketing, a lot of the people you talked to were salespeople who would just tell you whatever you wanted to hear. Like, please buy my widget. It will do any. Oh, you want it to pour coffee? It does that. You want it to fly a plane? Right. It does that. <laughs> buy my widget. And if, if when you talk to Phil or Jaws, they will explain the silicon. They'll explain the memory substructure. They will explain yep. the manufacturing process. They'll explain how the software. They are mostly engineers, very, very hands-on well, and very bright. About you know, in a yeah. way, this, in my opinion, is an upgrade because Jaws really is an engineer. Uh, Phil Schiller's yeah. uh, BS was in uh, biology. Um, I think well. <laughs> Phil was more a classic marketing guy who loved the product and loved the engineering. Jaws is an engineer. Uh, from from the way back, so, he's a classically educated classically engineer. educated engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a you, you work at Apple at that at such a high level that that that's much better on a resume than well, I don't have a degree in engineering, but I was a senior executive. At I, Apple agree. Before, I, never, I agree. I agree. But but I, but I, I I underscore what was said about Jaws. I haven't I haven't had I've only had one briefing with Phil. I've had many with Jaws, and he's the, not only I, I've and I've also had those like briefings with like marketing executives. Yes, where there is this, there is the script where we're trying to implant these phrases in your head. Uh, there, the times when, with when I when I had a briefing and I saw like Jaws in the room, it's like, oh, this is great. We can just have like a forty-five minute conversation about like every single note that I have and everything that I don't understand about the technology or anything that was unclear. And even if it's something he can't talk about, he will figure out what I'm really trying to ask and find a way to get that. He, he, it was always a very very deep conversation. So. I'm very, very. He's he's on that list of uh, of Apple people where I've known them for so long and I've had such good times with them that like I can't. Why won't you retire so we can hang out and become actual friends? Because <laughs> we have to. I can't. I can't ask you like out for a drink at a, at a trade show because that would be wrong. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Jaws, very, very glad. Jaws has been at Apple one year longer than Phil Schiller, but he's uh, not much younger than Phil Schiller, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Phil turned uh, sixty this year, so. It's kind of, you know, Apple doesn't say stepping down. They, the press release sounded like he was stepping up, but really, mm -hmm. he's stepping down, right? He's semi-retiring. I would sideways, say. yeah, sideways. He's 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 no longer overclocking his CPU. Let's yeah. say. The quote uh, <laughs> nice. from the quote from the statement is: "I first started at Apple when I was 27. This year I turned 60. It's time for some planned changes in my life. As somebody in his 60s, I understand." That usually means taking a little more time to enjoy life. Uh, you know, he's been there a long, long time, and he's done a lot of things. He's probably worked, as you say, really, really hard. Uh, but boy, you really have to say that, with the exception of Tim Cook, there have been some massive changes. Johnny Ive is gone. Angela Aarons is gone. Um, Steve Dowling is gone. We dealt more with Dowling, perhaps, uh, than the general public, because he was their internal PR guy. And then Phil Schiller, who was absolutely the figurehead, uh, second only to Steve Jobs uh, for this company for a long, long it's time. It's weird, though, because it's because their executives stay so long that when they change, it's a bit like you watch, you watch a lot of events, a lot of technology events, and it's different people every couple of years. And the people you deal with are different almost continuously, like especially to other companies. Normally, absolutely. So the CMO people. changes yeah, daily. That's why it's such a big thing when that happens yeah. at because they've been there for 30 years. Yeah. Um, so uh, Chris Espinoza, uh, who was like one of the original <laughs> Mac guys, tweeted, congratulations on being promoted to Apple Fellow. Joining, here are the other Apple Fellows, and this will give you some idea of where in the pantheon Phil Schiller's ending up. Steve Wozniak, Rod Holt, who was an early engineer on Apple II, Al Alcorn, same, Bill Atkinson, who designed QuickDraw, uh, mm. was very uh, involved in the, the design of the early Macintosh. Steve Capps, another Macintosh engineer. Rich Page, uh, Gershon Sadu, Gary Starkweather, Alan Kay, 
who is you yeah. know, as close to a god in personal computing as you can get, uh, Don Norman and Guy Kawasaki. Those are the Apple yeah. fellows, ladies and gentlemen. Legends, so many. I, I hope I hope they have like a I hope they have like a, an embroidered smoking jacket, like when they when you become an Apple fellow. <laughs> I hope it's like, not orange, like the, or what is it, green, like room. the master's jacket. Like master's. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's a nice color, anyway. <laughs> six colors, six colors. Oh, it might be six colors. Yeah. And you know the other thing about Phil, we always knew, uh, is his hobbies. He was, you know, he's a great photographer, right? They always showed off his yeah, photography. <laughs> uh, he was a scuba diver. Um, he, uh, he, is. he, I didn't know this. He Huge was a car aficionado. Cars, yep. drums. Huge. Uh, his BS was in Marine. He played biology. in a rock band very briefly, a progressive rock band. Prog rock fan. All of yeah. this is in his Twitter bio. So he's not going to be sitting on the roof having lunch. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's, that's what's always so interesting about the longevity of the executive careers at Apple, because my, my experience with people who are working at that kind of a level I'm, I'm talking about like mentally is that they get very, very restless after time where at some point they, they, uh, they do, they, they did everything that they, they wanted to achieve at a certain company. They are the really uh, envious in terms of what they've accomplished, but then they're like, but I really, really want to like be the, I really, really want to be the first people, the first one to photograph this, this presumed to be extinct species of bird. And then suddenly that's all they want to do or, I want to make movies now, or I want to, I want to be a truly become a philanthropist, as opposed to I want to hide some of my money in, a, in creative ways. It's 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 always been very interesting to me that people who tend to people who get to Apple tend at that level tend to stay at Apple. Again, the, they have these 10, 20, 30 year careers where it seems like, you know, it's like it's like being the uh, the first uh, the uh, the number one at uh, on the enterprise. You are not going to dynamite will take will blow uh, Riker out of that seat. And you wonder how long <laughs> it's going to take for other people to advance up. So that's just one of <laughs> a dozen big stories today. <laughs> I'm exhausted already. <laughs> Uh, the other uh, big story that uh, happened this morning, and I got the press release uh, on my. I have a I have a bot that follows uh, <laughs> Apple's PR the on my Telegram. <laughs> and there's no oh, you mean Oprah's book club. No, oh, I thought you meant Oprah's Oprah's book club. Oprah's book club is also in that. Yeah, that was the press release yesterday. <laughs> that gave me heart is palpitations number, when, because when there were rumors three about like Apple here. that all this stuff was ready. And I see the Apple logo come across the the notification center, and I'm like, "It's go time! It's go! It's Oprah's book club! <laughs> it's it's, a, it's Oprah's book club, everybody!" So no, that was yesterday. Today we get new uh, iMacs, but don't get your hopes up. These are not Apple Silicon. In fact, this is almost certainly exactly what Apple was referring to when they said, "We still have some Intel yeah. Macs mm -hmm. in the pipeline." Here they are, ladies and gentlemen. Your yeah. last. Intel Macintoshes. Um, they are the same design. They basically just put 10th generation Intel chips in them. Is that right? Renee, you already have done a, you're good. You've already done a video on YouTube about this. Um, yeah. So they, it's basically what they did with the 13 inch MacBook Pro. And that is they took the same chassis. They updated the silicon to the latest Intel generation, which is, is just more cores on the same process node. We all know that story by now. Latest AMD graphics. But also because the density and the pricing has changed on memory and storage, you can go up to 128 uh, you know, gigabytes of RAM now on the iMac. And by the way, I would uh, suggest that because I have 64 gigs of RAM on my iMac Pro and I still am able to re boot it just by leaving photos open so get 128 gigs maybe well like if maybe. you use logic especially like logic you're hard limited for the number of instruments based right. on the quantity of ram so That's if you are it. like you've been salivating for this basically 64 seems ridiculous except that there must be a memory leak in photos because if i leave it open invariably yeah. i'll come back to a rebooted <laughs> macintosh uh, I'm so glad they got rid of that stupid fusion drive. This was yeah, long almost. overdue. It's, it's still in the it's still on the Option. very bottom, very the 21 level. inch, yeah. 21 inch, yeah. But but, but, but for most of them, it'll be SSDs. Thank God. Yeah. But but what's but what's yeah. this about? Like the minimum being 256. That's like. I mean, my I, I've I've got more I've got more stores. It's it seems like and a huge amount of storage. Yeah, that that's like the that, that's like exactly. It seems like it's there, like the Cadillac that says, "Oh, you can get one without a radio, without air conditioning, uh, and it's in this ugly color." But for twenty dollars more, you can get the executive. It, it seems like it's only there Andy, so that people can think, "Oh, I'm not it. being the cheapest one." That's exactly why. 
Mm. That's it. There's a that's a well known, um, you know, the people, uh, Freakonomics folks. What do they call that? So yeah, behavioral. It's a marketing tactic. It's a marketing yeah. tactic. The wall, that's why the Wall Street Journal has a, a, a subscription level you will never, ever in a million years buy because it makes no sense. It costs more just to get the paper than to get the paper plus digital. Because <laughs> <laughs> they know no one's going to buy that one. That's the, the, the bottom yeah. of the line. Well, it's the so crappy I think that's, microwave, right? Like there's yeah. the crappy one that always breaks that you never want to buy. There's the normal one, and then there's a normal one that's just made out of more expensive parts. For I, rich I do have to admit, they works. offer that 256 gig storage across the entire 21 line so maybe it isn't completely the crappy version the usual story you hear about that is that it is intended for people who are almost entirely on external storage and all they really want is no. is is to boot up the machine no. and don't want to pay apple a they dime also for offer an eight gig ram configuration for the same yeah. dumb i honestly think it's so that they, they want to get you loosened up a little bit come on just spend a little more there come on just get, get that low price on once the, you on start the doing the build to order it's hard to stop uh, yeah. Well, it I'll, makes the lowest price one, just, just speaking low. to the marketing that you're talking yeah. about, it makes the lowest price one seem low where you go, oh, you know what? It's only seventeen ninety nine. I I can do that. And then, you know, you're looking at the specs and you're like, oh, I'm going to get a little more RAM and then it jumps up. But you <laughs> you jumped in to the pool because you saw right. seventeen ninety nine. you know? <laughs> yeah. They did. Did they upgrade the iMac Pro? I don't think so. Yes. They yeah. did. They did. Yeah. What's they, new? They, they, I mean, so to speak. They, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they basically now now that the regular base iMac nothing is about as powerful as last year's iMac Pro, they basically boosted the lower the the, the cheapest buy in for the iMac Pro to make it as powerful as the most a little bit more powerful than the most powerful iMac. So make it make it more a transition between iMac and then actually a jump to uh, the lowest uh, iMac Pro in terms of performance and then up from there. So the iMac Pro always started at 5000, but now you get a Xeon W10 core. That's 10 core. Yeah. That's yeah. the same, isn't it? Or no, you got eight before. It was six. eight core before. Okay. Yeah. 32 gigs core. of RAM. That you've always gotten that. A terabyte storage. That's maybe. So, okay, I get it. So they're just, they're not, but they're not putting newer chips in the iMac Pro, only in the iMac. Tenth gen. I mean, I don't know. I don't, is there a 10th generation It's not clear to me Xeon? what Intel's doing with Xeon yeah. At, yeah. Yeah. at this point. Good Lord. Uh, it's about. Although they have been updating the AMD. So AMDs. glad they're abandoning <laughs> <laughs> Intel at this point, it just it's just depressing over there. So tenth generation. Let's 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 uh, just see how how much, just see how much you'd pay. Yeah, I did that. It's amazing. Yeah. Get you, do, just hide your wallet first. Hide your wallet. <laughs> so just the base model, twenty seven inch five K is twenty two ninety nine. Do we want to get nano texture glass? Yes. No. <laughs> we disagree on this. Yes. It's just such high maintenance. It looks gorgeous, but you have to use, you a, have special use a special cloth to clean mop. it. Yeah. And I know I will never do that. And why do you like it, Lori? Because it's got little bumps on it that I've been wanting to touch for the last two years. <laughs> but you it's can't less glary. It. It's less glary, right? It is. It's yeah. it's gorgeous. I've I have seen it on the pro display and it's really beautiful. It really does look so I, I love the idea of a matte screen, but I don't love the execution of most matte screens. They right. kind of look like there's a they film of Vaseline yeah. over the front of yeah, them, and it. the the yeah. nano texture on the on the the XDR Pro definitely does not have that. So oh, okay. presumably this this screen would be the same. It would All be right. clear and crisp, but but also matte. Lori sold me. Sorry, Renee. We're going to spend five hundred dollars on the <laughs> nano texture. Let me just point glass. out again that she got yelled at by Phil Schiller for trying to touch. Yes, the, yeah. uh, no, I did. Don't touch it. <laughs> Don't touch it. That's at least hard. I asked permission. <laughs> yeah, it's hard uh, not to. You can get an i9 in this one, 10 cores, nice. Again, don't know how that compares to the Xeon W 10 core. It's faster in its single uh, chip clock speed or max clock speed is 3.6 gigahertz, up to 5 gigahertz. RAM, that's where we're going to go crazy. Look at that, 2,600 bucks. You're more than doubling it if you just go to the 128 gigs RAM by itself. Who I think get, you should start with you should get the eight gigs because you can you can add uh, RAM to the twenty seven inch oh, that's aftermarket. Right. It's got a little you can get hole. a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah. That's, so on the twenty seven, start with the basic. On yeah. any Mac that it's easy to add RAM, and that's not all of them. It would. I think be it's worth, only the twenty seven inch iMac and then the iMac Pro. Yeah, I, you can't do it on the twenty one inch. Does it? But if you get eight gigs, does it mean fewer slots or no? You get the full co complement of slots. You still get the. Yeah, you still get the number of slots. You just don't get the 
So Chip then go there. to other world computing or crucial or mm-hmm. some more course there, get your own Ram. You'll save exactly. money. Yeah, that's a lot. Of, exactly. That's a lot of money. So we're going to get, we're going to get eight gigs. Um, now video cards, we're still stuck with these pathetic Radeon pros. <sighs> they say next generation, but they're not Navi two. As far as I could tell, they no. look like they're just our DNA. Yeah. So I wouldn't spend any money on that. Storage goes all the way up to eight terabytes. But well, again, you can't change them later. So if you if you do want to oh, do something you're stuck that's more with the graphics capable, card. that's your only. You yeah. might want to max yeah. that just because that's the best you could do. Can't you use an eGPU with this, though? Yes. So that would be your way of, of getting a better video card down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, to be fa- and to be fair, eGPUs are about the same price as a high-performance graphics card you get for, uh, for Windows. So yeah. there is some equivalency there. Yeah. Uh, storage wise, um, I think it's nutty to go to eight because I think you, you don't want to put all your eggs inside this basket. Get Particularly it. because the basket is sealed up and yeah. you can't get at it easily. Yeah, get yeah. a terabyte. If it was a laptop, I would say do it because traveling without external drives is just yeah. so much easier, safer, and better for data protection. Actually, but if it's right. sitting on your desk. Yep. Two terabytes for my, I always get two terabytes for my laptops, one terabyte for my iMac or desktops. I'm going to get eight oh. gigabytes next time. Gig terabytes, sorry. You're going to get eight terabytes? For the next laptop? laptop I get, for sure, because Final yeah. Cut Pro is so thirsty. Jeez, it is Louise. so thirsty. All right. Well, that'll be that Max Silicon one. By the way, that is yeah. one thing now. They all have T2 chips. Yep. And mm-hmm. they all have upgraded 1080p cameras. One would think f- for face recognition, but no. Not the 2.5, not the 21 inch. That's still got the 720p potato cam. <laughs> It's so hard to believe. And my iMac Pro actually has 1080p. It's a very good camera on the yeah, iMac Pro. It's a good camera. Yeah. It should be so, everywhere. Yeah, that's good. But the T, but the T2 does also gives us faster SSD performance, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's got it the, becomes it's basically the, 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 a, the A10 chip from the Apple, yeah. uh, from the amazing? iPhone 7. So it's that's got every, amazing. all the storage controllers, the image signal Apple processor. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And then you can get regular gigabit Ethernet or for 100 bucks more 10 gigabit. Ethernet. It's basically a coprocessor, but I wonder if their deal with Intel prevents them from ever calling it that. Yeah. <laughs> the T2? It's, yeah. just, a, it's yeah. just a controller chip. Please. <laughs> it does the H.265. It does it does so much. It does yeah. all the sound, the audio processing. So without buying the 8 terabyte, oh, I did buy the 8 terabyte. Let's go back down to 1 terabyte. <laughs> with the 1 terabyte, I did actually get this pretty close to the cost of the base model iMac Pro with 64 gigs of RAM and a 10 core processor. I think this is actually, you're right, this verges to iMac Pro territory. But here's the real question Get the 10 gigabit Ethernet. Why? It's only $100 more. Oh, you might as well. Yeah, it's not, it's not our yeah. money. <laughs> <laughs> here's the real, yeah, no, I'm still under 5,000. Get here's, the hat. <laughs> there's, there's a it's hat? Be a $380 hat. <laughs> Why isn't there a hat? Um, <laughs> hey, at least it, it comes with a stand. That's a good, that's a blessing. <laughs> Why would you buy an Intel Mac at this point? Uh, well, like one. there's a couple really important, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> well, Renee's sorry. got a much better uh, things to no, say about it, sure. but there's two things. One, somebody who wants Intel, they're not afraid or, or they're afraid to be a first, uh, you know, a, a, a first adopter to the the Apple Silicon Mac. They don't want Apple Silicon. They want Intel. They know Intel. They're familiar with Intel. So that's one reason. And the most important reason, and Renee will probably say this, is if you need a computer, you need a computer now. It doesn't matter what chip is in it. So that's, you know, the other important reason. Yeah. I was going to say different stuff. Go ahead. <laughs> so that's different stuff. Go ahead. No, she's absolutely right. Uh, I was going to also say that if you if you depend on boot camp or running uh, oh, Intel version of that's Windows, a good point. you're going to need this. And also, if you depend on some of the high, you know, uh, the high end 3D rendering stuff, you barely got Mac Intel support for that. And who knows if or when they'll bring that stuff over to um, to the ARM Macs. And and you can use you can use uh, the Rosetta for it. But if you're really doing high end, like Good uh, point. Stuff like, like Brianna Wu would be doing, right. it won't be tolerable yeah. for you. Unity 5, you're going to want this. Or yeah. whatever it is, yeah. Unity's um, porting, also, but Real hasn't said they are. So it, Real but it could be, But it's really yeah. like, and Maya's going to port, but it's it's this, like, like what's called photo brush or paint. Like, some of the stuff Alex uses uh, that, he, that he has to use on a PC, that's the reason. In fact, last chance, kids. Get your Intel Mac while you can. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, seriously. That's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> also, also like this, if this is a good gear to, if you do need, if you do need a Mac and you need to, and you're, you're worried about getting Intel, this would be a f- okay gear because within the five year, uh, time frame of, uh, the maximum usage of a brand new Mac, I don't think there's going to be a huge difference between, I mean, uh, uh, cer- certainly if you wait until next year, like, uh, like, uh, Renee said through his proxy, <laughs> Lori, <laughs> that, that, that is exactly <laughs> what I was going to say that if you, if you keep waiting and waiting and waiting, cause you know, a new, new, new thing's going to come up, you're never going to have it. And then in the next year, you're going to lose all the benefits of having a machine that is one year old, as opposed to the eight year old Mac that you're, that you're trying to replace it with. So. It's going to be a false economy. I think I've mentioned this before, but there's also the sort of average consumer that that you you want to think about too. There are lots and lots of people that don't give a flying f about what chip is in their <laughs> computer. They just want a computer. They're not going to care whether it's Apple Silicon or Intel. So this is the latest, most updated version of an iMac for those people, for, for people who aren't waiting for the the new big changes. They they just need a new computer. They don't even know what Intel versus ARM versus I Apple tell Silicon you though, even is. In eight months, when the new iMac with fins comes out, <laughs> they're gonna feel pretty <laughs> left behind. Those not people, you're right, they're not looking at the inside, but I I promise you the Apple Silicon Max will look very different and will have features that will make you want them in well, independent but, of but, the silicon. But there's going to be a lot of people who they don't care about that kind of stuff. You know, there's there's so many people in this world who just need X to work and they They're want buying PCs. whatever they can They're buy. They're not this buying year. Macs. Those are those are <laughs> no, people you, who are still buying Windows for reasons no one understands. You're Paul right. understands those um, reasons, sir. No, even Paul you're right on, he in the know. partial <laughs> on that. But with, you know, like Apple, the iPhone became so popular that people are now buying whatever iPhone they can afford. It has nothing to do with whether it's the most recent one. They're just buying the iPhone they can afford because it got so popular. Yeah, so but that's an iPhone. In, in a way. Nobody's buying right, desktop so I computers. Think in a way, Apple is, Apple is trying to position itself as being the company where if you just need a computer, we've got one for you. No. We've got the most recent no. one for you with the most no, advanced not. features. No, <laughs> no. If you just need a computer, you're going to buy a $500 Windows machine. No. Mm. The, anybody, it's first of all, computer. nobody's buying desktop computers. The people who are buying desktop computers are businesses who are buying Windows. They're not buying Macs. And professionals who know better. I, don't, I have to think there's a very scant market for this. Students, computer. especially right Students, now. With maybe the they're fall. going back to school, but even there, aren't mm-hmm. they buying laptops? Why would you buy a desktop? Yeah, front of house was huge not, for iMac. Not anymore. I, nobody's in the front of house anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, I I mean, think so, this was like a marketing, a marketing uh, a positioning for Apple that they're they're trying to capitalize on the fact that they just launched a new iMac. So all these students are going back to school at home. Yeah, that's who this is. We'll have a desktop. Yeah. All these children, all these parents with children, and they're they've got to get them up to speed. Uh, you know, with whatever's there. I, you know, it's not cheap, but it, it's the latest iMac. So I think, oh, you know, they're the saying we've got iMac. a computer right it's now. It's also the last iMac. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to feel so out of date next year. I can absolutely promise you, having bought an Apple Cube on the very last day, you could buy an <laughs> Apple Cube. I know what these people are headed for. They may not know it. There is another group. Actually, there's the hedge funds. The people who think Apple Silicon is going to be a massive flop. Who may say, yeah, last chance to get Mac OS on Intel, the last great Mac. There is a small but finite chance that'll happen too, right? This is the last yeah. good Mac. I don't, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But I don't the, either. The, the, when, you, when you talk about the uncertainty, you're also talking about what if, uh, again, what if you need you, you you like the iMac form factor, you need a new one. How much are you willing to bet that Apple is definitely going to have one uh, this year? Like there, the common wisdom with that with air quotes around it is that we'll have an iPhone event and then a desktop event maybe a month after that. And there's no guarantee that they're going to say, and we're and these new the, the first generation Apple Silicon Macs are going to be are, are available for order today. They might say, here it is. We're going to be uh, announcing a ship date when we're ready to ship it, or uh, the, or uh, they'll announce uh, an Apple uh, Silicon Mac that is not the Mac that you want. For me, I mean, f- uh, my in my circumstance, 
the only Apple Ma the only Apple Mac uh, Silicon Mac that I'm interested in is a Mac Mini because the iMac doesn't work for me. The Mac Pro is almost certainly going to be priced out of my uh, out of my reasonability range, uh, and I could be waiting upwards of a year for uh, uh, for a Mac Mini version of Apple Silicon. And, and people every time when I tweeted about this, oh well, Apple's shipping a shipping a, a, a Apple Silicon Mac Mini right now to developers. No, they're not. They're shipping <laughs> they're shipping a developer like test bed that they that uh, people can borrow for a few months but they have to send back to apple there's no promise that that's going to actually ship anytime this year so the question is just like Lori was saying how long do you want to wait hoping that to, not knowing exactly when apple's going to ship you the, mach the machine that you actually actually want so for a lot of people, if you need an iMac and if you've been holding off for like uh, for eight years and remember that one of the advantages and the, the, the boat anchors of being an Apple user is that you're not forced, <laughs> you're not forced to uh, due to incompetence of hardware to, to upgrade before the thing just absolutely collapses like the blues mobile at the end of the movie. These things can go over, keep going and going and going and going and you wind up with an eight year old machine that suddenly, you know, can't stream in 4K video the way you want to. And now is the time you absolutely need to upgrade as opposed to maybe I could maybe I can upgrade maybe I can't so there are a lot of there's still a lot of uncertainties I think it's going to be a success but you don't know when the machine that you want the one that you need is going to be shipping with Apple silicon and it sounds like notebooks this fall anyway not uh, yeah 13 inch yeah. MacBook Pro I I honestly I'm telling you folks just listen to Leo he's done this before <laughs> I've been around the block <laughs> If you can wait till next year, I would strongly wait. Suggest wait till next year. Yeah. Uh, if you can't what wait, if, if you're a student going off, you know, you're freshman in college and you don't you don't have anything to use, okay. But uh, boy, I'd wait. <laughs> I'd wait. Would I be thrown out of this club if I said I think that there's going to be another Intel Mac before they stop making them? Entirely? Really? No, I you wouldn't know. be thrown I, out, but you'd surprise me. Why? I. I, I don't know why, but I just have a feeling we're going to see another new what would, Intel. Be Pro. what would it be? A 16 inch MacBook Pro 10th generation. There we go. <laughs> that would be, I would, I would like that. That, that would actually be. make sense because it'll be a year before yeah. the Apple Silicon 16 inch, probably, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it just, I, I would thought we were getting it earlier. Like, I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go all out on the last one because I was yeah. hoping we'd get it earlier. We didn't. Well, these are incremental up, upgrades, though, to existing machines. And a 16-inch right. MacBook Pro would be an incremental upgrade. It'd be 10th generation Intel. Honestly, yeah. I am so happy with my two or what is it, two or three-year-old iMac Pro. I see. No, I have no pressure to upgrade that. No, uh, you shouldn't. Yeah, I don't need to. But I do. I do believe there will be FOMO next year, or what is the opposite of FOMO? Shucks, I didn't miss out. <laughs> <laughs> Shomo. I'm glad I waited. <laughs> Shimo. <laughs> uh, that, that, when you see the new uh, iMac with fins and glitter ball, mm. you're going to go, oh, <laughs> crap. I love that. Yeah. What? I'll give you a couple things. Face ID, right? That's why it's yeah, not on this cares? one. Who cares? Okay. I mean, I, it's... How many, how many times do I log... How many times do I log in on a, on a desktop? Like in, once in the morning and that's about it. I it's, use it's Windows really Hello, and it's nice. nice. I, I have like to it. say, yeah. yeah. I walk by, yeah. and my watch goes. Brrr, we unlocked your computer. Brrr, I do like that. You're right. If you have an Apple Watch, you don't need anything else. But. I would like it anyway, though, because I don't need the little brrr thing. Because sometimes I'm just walking by. Like, the brrr's you know, like, annoying. Calm down, and down by the way, it's watch. not just unlocking. Think of all the times you reauthenticate, but you wouldn't yeah. have to. Yeah, that's right. True. For pur for purchases, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, I'm not sure I, I need face ID on my iMac, but touch ID on my iMac yeah. I think would be wor well worth it. I wonder if you they'll know? do that. Make the keyboard too expensive. So my understanding is that it makes the keyboard too expensive yeah. because you, mm -hmm. you have to have basically an Apple Watch inside it. Right. And now the T2 chip is even more. The original T1 chip. They're going to go the straight to face 2, ID. Yep. And the T2 chip is the iPhone 7. Yeah. So and no one. I say they sold a magic keyboard for 300 bucks, but we complained. And I think if the, <laughs> if the iMac magic keyboard was like 400 bucks, just because it has a dumb display in it because they, and the reason it has a display is because they want to show you the actual number and nobody can defraud you by displaying a, right. the, the bogus number next to the, so anyways, it's a thing. I think they'll find enough, uh, surface features to make you feel like, boy, I bought the, I bought the cube. I bought the last it's emoji with Face ID on the on the iMac, Leo. That's the only thing holding it back. If it had Memoji, they would sell it. Oh, it's true. It could have Memoji. Yeah. 
but I, but I do agree with you 100. percent It's not just this. Uh, not only am I looking for, am I anticipating a huge speed performance, but I'm also looking forward to Apple dropping its handcuffs and saying, here's the things that we can do that can be enabled by hardware and yeah. a desktop that we just, just like all the stuff we were able to do just because it seemed like a good idea or because, uh, uh, or, or because, uh, we're not bottlenecked by uh, by hardware constraints. Uh, if we can put everything on our own custom chip, the idea of having like even higher refresh rates, having iMacs that look that feel even more liquid than they do right now, that would be interesting. The idea these will be it. out of the box. That's the, the main point. Yeah. And so you're buying something in the box right now, but because we're all in the box, we go, yeah, that's great. Yeah. If you if okay, that's how you think, buy a Windows PC because. <laughs> Well, because they're going to yeah, stay in the box for a long freaking time. But there's well, going to be a new kind of thing said, next year you're going to wish you had. No, but it is fair what Lori said. Like for the, for people who are like Alex or like me when I edit my like, – I cannot afford any problems. I cannot afford any Reve boards. I cannot afford any software incompatibility. No fun, fun issues to debug. Uh, <laughs> and, and so like buying this now and holding it for – two because pros, like they pay off their machines with gigs and with clients and stuff. So getting this now, holding it for two years, feel like, like it's a very, very safe bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I got, I, I, can, can I can I say something that might be somewhat shocking? Well, maybe not coming from me, but this is this the uh, the announcement of Apple Silicon really upended my hardware buying plans for the next year. I I pretty much I my decision had been that I've got fifteen hundred dollars close to two thousand dollars set aside for a brand new Mac Mini with whatever the latest thing is at the by the end of this year. If there's Apple Silicon, don't know what I'll do then, but it'll change that. And now I'm thinking that because the uh, again the form factor that I need in a, in a desktop Mac is traditionally a, a Mac Mini, we're probably not going to get that this year. We might get a a, a lower a thirteen inch uh, MacBook Pro this year instead. Now my thinking is. I'm bro I'm broadening my thinking to okay. Well, why do you need a big desktop, a powerful desktop Mac? And, you, and it comes down to things like, again, being able to stream, uh, uh, stream in high definition like this, what, like we're doing right now. The idea that in the next year or so, I might want to try to uh, pl uh, play with 4K video editing, uh, Photoshop, things that are really, really high performance, uh, uh, Premiere, uh, Premiere After Effects. And the uh, and I'm starting to think, well, what if we took like the money that we some uh, maybe half of the money, three quarters of the money we put aside for a Mac Mini this year, we build a PC that is high performance, but that is tailored to exactly the sort of stuff that I want high performance thing to make that the boring sort of like boiler in the basement that just gets the job done for high performance stuff. But then when I see a Apple Silicon uh, Mac Mini come out next year. I will buy that for all the Mac stuff, for all the stuff that involves like me actually doing my creative work, all, all my writing and all my uh, communicating and stuff like that. Or even, God forbid, actually buying a MacBook Pro uh, at the end of this year, knowing that I can still, I, I can, I'll be able to split my bets amongst uh, multiple machines. That's uh, that's how revolutionary this idea is. I don't foresee a future, uh, a future without having Apple Silicon on my desktop. And now I'm starting to think about. What do what what is precluding me from wanting to buy a new MacBook Pro? What is precluding me from wanting to buy a Mac Mini this year or, or in the next uh, next like two quarters? And there's a it, 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 that's just an indication of how much this disrupts uh, in a positive way the buying decision for people who still love Macs who still want to continue to carry Macs through forward. How do you like my outfit? Not Lovely. to change the Fantastic. subject. <laughs> it's very dark. It's very black. I'm going to take off the jacket. But the rest of it comes from Taylor Store. This is my, this is a custom shirt that I got from Taylor Store. And now I was really pleased. Taylor Store sells chinos. I'll show you my chinos. <laughs> Look at that. This, the, nice. by the way, this, these fit perfectly. And uh, because Taylor Store does something unique. These are custom tailored clothes. And you use their Size Me app to take a picture of you. And then that's the measurement. And then they send you shirts that fit like it was a tailor made it for you. Because it is custom made. I love Taylor Store. Uh, I've been using their stuff for some time. And now they've added so many new options. The Size Me app just completely changes the measurement process using advanced technology and algorithms. Uh, they actually have a quick size option if you if you don't want to do this, which creates a measurement profile in just a few simple steps. You enter your height, your weight. Their algorithm does the measurement profile. 
One of the things I really like, when you go to Taylor's store and you order your first products, you get one right away. I got my shirt. I got the new shirts. This is actually my old one, but I got some new shirts. I got one of them, and I got the new chinos, one of them. And I ordered a suit, too, because they do suits now. And they sent, so they sent me a shirt, and they sent me the pants. They said, if these fit, we'll send you the rest of them. They did. The suit was fun. They send you a, a fake suit. It's like in canvas. You, I actually kind of tempted to wear it. I might wear it someday. It's a canvas suit. Uh, and then you take pictures of yourself in the suit and you say, you know, I'd like this to be a little roomier. And in fact, I did. They're going to send me another sizer. So they're very careful with the suit. Still, the suits are just a little over 300 bucks. And you and but the best part about Taylor's store, well, there's two best parts. One is that, that they're custom. The other is, boy, do you get choices. The fabrics, the thread color, the buttons, the embroidery. I chose the lining in my suit. You can, it's it's more than just tailored, it's me. Um, customized dress shirts, chinos, suits, polo shirts, shorts. When my suit comes, I'll wear it. It's a beautiful uh, suit. I'm really excited about it. And and if you're at all concerned that can this possibly work, well, besides the fact that everybody here has done it, and uh, Micah and I both wear our Taylor store clothes all the time, they're rated 4.7 out of 5 stars by thousands of customers on Trustpilot. Uh, here's an ex here's just a, a sample review from uh, Constantinos. The vast variety of fabrics and an easy customization tool are just the beginning. These guys create some of the best shirts and garments on the internet. Literally, I am not going to buy a pret a porte a ready to wear shirt ever again. Me neither. I'll, I completely agree with you, Constantino. Stephen Roberts says, fit is always as expected, quality is top-notch, and shipping routinely seems to be faster than originally given as well. Yeah, I got my uh, my, my shirt within a few days. Um, it's pretty cool. If, if the shirt doesn't fit, you don't have to mail it back. Just donate it to charity or a friend that, that does fit. And say, this doesn't fit, and they'll send you one that does. So there's, it's a really great process. Then once you've got it all, of course, now you can go to Taylor's store anytime and get more great clothes. I am such a fan of this company. They do everything right, including the factories in, uh, in where the, I think it's Sri Lanka. They will send you pictures of your clothing as it's being made. They're just, re they're very conscious. They're uh, carbon neutral. I just love this company and I'm really happy to have them. Right now we got, we, we said Taylor store, Taylor store. This is a perfect time for you because people don't want to go buy clothes, but maybe they knew it need a new zoom shirt or maybe they're getting ready to go back to work. Now's the time to do this touchless measuring and delivery. And so they said, all right, well, here's what we'll do. 20% off plus free shipping, not just for your first purchase, but for every purchase through October 31st. 20% off and free shipping through October 31st. But you have to go to taylor.store.com slash twit and use the offer code twit. That is such a good offer. Uh, and actually, we thought they we thought they didn't we thought they didn't they made a mistake. <laughs> what you mean the first one? No, no, every purchase until October thirty first. T a i l o r store dot com slash twit. If it's time to get new clothes, maybe you're ready to emerge from quarantine, or maybe you just want to have a Zoom shirt that looks better. Honestly, I I love I needed suits, and I've been waiting for them to do suits. Now that they do suits, and look at the fabrics. <sighs> I'm very boring. I just got black. But my new shirts are a little bit more colorful. You've seen me in my flamingo shirt, though. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I'm starting to branch out. Mike is a little bit more adventurous than I am. They have such gorgeous fabrics. And you can get everything just right. You know, they say, do you want one vent in your suit or two vents or no vents? Do you want a shirt pocket? Do you want no pocket? Do you want a monogram? Where do you want the monogram? It's completely customizable. Or just say, no, I want this one. You know, they have, uh, on the website, they have our most popular shirts. And you just say, yeah, yeah, that's easy. Just pick that one. But actually, uh, and I've done that too, and they're all very nice. But to, to customize this, I'm just show you the interface so you get some, some idea of what's going on. Now, remember, they already have my measurements. So everything I'm doing here, I can do uh, completely. I know this shirt will fit perfectly, completely with my measurements. You could choose... Look at all the collars. I decided to do a crazy thing. 
I ordered five shirts with no collar. I just thought, I'm ready for collarless. I'm ready to be a big boy now. But if you want to be like, uh, like the billionaires and you want to have the, the Jeff Bezos spread collar, you can get that. If you want to be like uh, George Will and have a collar, a pin collar with a collar stay, you can do that. I have, uh, I've kind of now eliminated, I used to be such a preppy. It was always the same button down. I have changed my life. What's a placket? I now know. <laughs> do you know what a placket is? Look, that's with the placket. That's without a placket. You can look at the difference. Can you see the difference? Placket? No placket. Oh, that's a placket or a narrow placket. I had no idea whether to, you could choose your placket, folks. Taylor Store, T A I L O R Store dot com slash twit. Don't forget the offer code twit. 20% off your first order and every order through Halloween plus free shipping. Some terms and conditions apply. I love these guys. Every time I talk to them, I kind of go, oh, you guys are so cool. You're so great. Taylor Store. Thank you, Taylor Store. We're glad to have you back because I got some more shirts. Actually, before they came back, I ordered a ton of shirts and pants. I saw, they got chinos. They said, they have suits. I can't wait to get my suit. You're going to love it. TaylorStore.com slash twit. Offer code twit. Okay, so we did the Phil Schiller. We did the new IMAX. April quarterly results came out last week. <laughs> Feels so um, much. Feels uh, so much. Did they have a good quarter? They had a good uh, quarter. Yeah. Let's put it this way. They surpassed Saudi Aramco to become the world's most valuable company on Friday. Uh, partly because of their Thursday uh, stock results. Shares were up 10%. 10%. And they've even gone up more. In fact, we'll talk about the testimony uh, last week. But the entire, all four, uh, the big tech companies that testified, their stocks went up $250 billion after the testimony. They had a shelter-in-place bump. <laughs> it wasn't after the testimony. It was after shelter-in-place when we were all desperate for yeah. new computers and new things to walk yeah. on them and buy for yeah. them. Tech, baby. Who knew tech was going to be the next big thing? <laughs> um, really, really, uh, really uh, good quarter. Really, really, really good. How good was the quarter? Lori, you can you can give us the rundown. I, it was really, really, really good. Really, good. really, really <laughs> it was, good. It was a lot better than they expected. And I, like based on the things that were... That, that they did really well in. It's actually kind of unsurprising because of the sort of shelter in place orders. Uh, more people are looking for things like iPads, uh, Macs, lap laptops, um, things like that. So it really, they got a boon from that for sure. And they were prepared, honestly. They were, they were not prepared for the pandemic, but they pivoted really well for the pandemic. They, they got them, their ducks in a row pretty quickly to prepare for it, so... Pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, I was surprised to see 60% of their business is global, not in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, for, I think, the first time in a long time, iMac, I mean, iPad and Mac led Apple's financial results. I guess that's the shelter-in-place shelter bump, place. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, iPhone SE was fortuitous to launch when it did. Yeah, Right. Now, one thing we thought yeah. might be w worrisome, I didn't think so, but there were a lot of pundits saying, oh, services, they're weak and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> services, 15% up. It's a, it's a wide category. We'll just, yeah. my favorite thing was Neil Seibart uh, when the results came in going, why didn't you all, why didn't all you people tell me you bought new iPads and Macs? It would have changed everything. Yeah. People. <laughs> oh! <laughs> this is projections for those who are a little off. Yeah, whoops. Um, I mean, I just, I, I, I always go to Six Colors to get uh, Jason Snell's uh, graphs yeah. to get some uh, sense of it. iPhone Look seems less dominant, right? It used to be more than half of revenue. That's such a good thing, though, because it means the other yeah. products are, you know, the big concern was that, uh, you know, because the iPhone is always going to fail. If it does well this year, it's just even less chance it's going to do well next year. Come on, people. Yep. And it's showing that, you know, Apple is putting other products in the field and those products can do well. And while iPhone is still a huge earner for them, it's not a huge dependency 
which is like Wall Street's favorite thing is grow this business. Grow, oh, you grow it so big. Now we're worried about it. <laughs> uh, year to year, year to over year total revenue growth, 11%. Very nice. Mac up $7 billion. Uh, year to year, Mac revenue change, 22% increase. iPad, 31% over last year. iPad revenue, $6.6 .6 billion. I mean, the iPhone is $26 billion, although because this is an off quarter, uh, that's, that's actually better than we would have expected. Their peaks are always mm -hmm. in the first quarter of the year. We're in Q3. Revenue up 2%. Services revenue, you like that line. It maybe isn't as big a, a growth as it has been in the past. $13.2 billion in revenue. That's off a little bit, isn't it? I think with the services, the one, there's kind of a lot of comment on on how serv streaming services grew exponentially across the board because of the pandemic. And there was a, there's been a lot of question about like, you know, how is Apple weathering the streaming services, which this is about their revenue. So obviously that's not going to matter because nobody's paying for Apple TV plus yet, but it's, I, I do wonder whether or not Apple TV plus is, is going to weather the storm. I, it, you know, if they're not, you know, X, like, lots more traffic than they ever were before, then they're looking at a danger zone because everybody grew, you know, Netflix and Hulu yeah. and HBO and Disney, all of these other organizations grew, 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 grew during the last four months. But we're not hearing anything about that with Apple. And obviously they don't they don't report numbers, you know, called out like that. But I do wonder whether or not T V plus saw traffic increases and whether or not they're they have some things, some plans in place to f fix that, which honestly, as much money as they've dumped into TV plus, they're not letting go of that. They're going to do what they have to do to make it a, a service that that is sustainable. It's just it might be harder than it would have been had the pandemic not taken place. Well, I mean, there's clearly the flaw in TV plus is no catalog. And. Right. There's just not enough content no to keep people. Yeah. yeah, there's not you enough content to keep either. people subscribing because you've seen it all or you've seen everything you want to see anyway. And Oprah's new book is not going to probably draw more, uh, much more traffic. And there's nothing traffic. coming. And like if yeah. they had a Mandalorian yeah. or they had a Game of Thrones or they had a Sopranos or they had like one of those things that makes a service for as long as that was showing new episodes, that'd be great. Uh, but like you said, the, the next job after the big hit is I'm bored now. What do I watch after that? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. But they It'll can fix that. It takes time. I mean, you yeah. know, HBO didn't have catalog when it started I'm out. Running out of money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and also TV Plus was always going to be a slow burn anyway. So right. there were lower expectations for it to. It's, right. it's not like exactly. QB where they're saying, how come you're just <laughs> doing 17 percent of what you said you'd do as, as the absolute minimum? Uh, it'd be interesting if there are metrics on uh, when the the big of the biggest event that Apple seems to have had was the acquisition of uh, Tom Hanks Greyhound movie. So it'll be interesting. They'll, that would be an interesting metric to take a look at that when there is something that is well promoted, well uh, broad demographic. Uh, sort of like an event for Apple TV, even then were people just simply not aware that there is this thing called Apple TV next to Netflix, next to YouTube, next to Hulu, next to Disney Plus that they can actually get entertainment from. Because if, if the numbers for that were pretty, pretty low, that indicates a, a need for extra work. That, that would be a concern. Well, $11.3 billion in profit so the most interesting thing months. for me on the services is that um, T Tim Cook made a commitment to shareholders and to Wall Street that Apple would double their services revenue uh. by this year. And they achieved that six months mm -hmm. early. And he did he declined to make another commitment that they yeah. would redouble it again over the next two yeah. years. And a huge portion of that is app store revenue, way more than it used to. It, it's just it's still a huge it's, money maker. It's the driver. And it's one of the most controversial ones. So I'm I'm hoping against hope that his reticence to renew that commitment is because they're rethinking all the stuff we've been talking about with the App Store for the last, you know, several months, years. Well, we're going to get to the App Store because it's, you know, it's still, boy, it's such a debate. And I kind of respect Alex Lindsay's point of view, which is, hey, Apple built this. If you, if you wanted to open a Forever 21 in the local mall... You, you wouldn't expect to do it for free. 
you got to pay rent. I feel like you get 10 years for that, right? Like your like your your innovation your innovation tax like gets you 10 years and then after that the world changes so much that you've got to figure out no. a new model. And there's also exceptions and things you didn't think about. And that's really, yeah. I think it's the edges. Unforeseen. It's the edge cases that they're getting in trouble. We're going we're to get to that in a little yep. bit. But enough to say a good quarter, a better than yep. expected quarter for Apple. They More did switchers announce, again, too. Say again? More switchers again, too. Uh, Tim Cook was very happy to announce that more people were switching oh, to iPhone switchers. than before as well because of the iPhone SE, I think, primarily. Yeah. And the number of most popular phones they still have is ridiculous in so many markets. It's like they're number one and two out of three in North America, one, two, and three out of four, I think, in the United Kingdom, uh, three or four out of six in some of the other markets. IPhone they aren't the number one phone, phone manufacturer in the world. Huawei, of all people, is followed by, by Samsung. By volume, though, not by product. By volume, by number of They hand, sell more hand. phones, but Apple's phone is more, Apple's single phone is the most popular, but Huawei sells many more phones. Like They make so many phones, like Samsung. They make so many right. phones yeah. that so, in sheer tonnage, but no single phone outsells them. Which Apple single phone is the most popular? Yeah. All of them? Yeah, see, that's, well, the iPhone that's, 11 is the most popular phone, and I forget what number two was. I, I don't think he elaborated. But are on what they comparing? I'm sure we could look it up somewhere. Okay. All right. And that, that's that's always been a weird statistic. It's it's not meaningless, but when you're talking about how if you want a phone that runs iOS, if you bind to the ecosystem, that's the that's your that's the only game in town. You can't you don't have options. Whereas uh, in the Android space, if you want to buy a premium Android phone, you've got at least six premium options and at least twelve really really good uh, like five hundred to four hundred dollar options. So I don't I I've never really understood exactly what it means, except for the fact that iPhones, iPhones is popular. Apple well, I mean, uh, also like, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add that, you know, Sam, Samsung and Huawei have basically the, the banks of a countries behind them. So it's not, it's like other Android vendors would love to sell that many, but they don't have the market share and the marketing that drives that market share because they don't have like virtually unlimited bank accounts. I think HTC well, wishes. They did. All, all these companies also wish they had Apple's checkbook. <laughs> yes. The number one most valuable company beating Saudi Aramco. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing Fossil fuel stint. oligopoly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You see, if, if, if Apple were really serious about their environmental stuff, they would just like buy, they would like acquire oil companies and force them to stop <laughs> selling oil. Like, let's uh, stop, stop this piddling around with, the ooh, ooh, we're using recycled aluminum. Apple is going to, uh, Apple stock once again, climbing up almost $500. They're going to do a four for one. Or a stock split on August 24th. So if you have... Moving, we have the worst career ever. Because if all of us had just not gone into journalism uh, and bought Apple shares <laughs> with our piggy bank, uh, we would all be sitting on the beach now collecting 20%. So somebody in the chat room said his, the stock, the Apple stock that he bought in uh, 2008 is worth, what did he say? Five times more, something like that. 500%. That's not bad. <sighs> Sigh. Yeah. Well, that's life. If we chose journalism, <laughs> <laughs> we get to talk about it. <laughs> uh, uh, and I know nothing about the stock market, so I probably saved myself uh, more Same. money than I've lost. I would have lost twice over. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like I was, I've, every time I've been under, every time I've tried to answer the question of, even if we get past the ethical stuff, there's the legal stuff of how much do you know that's not public knowledge, right, and could right. you, how, how how much are you willing to prove that you didn't actually? Eh, yeah, it's it's not worth it. Hey, I was a little concerned when I read this. I don't know, maybe uh, one of you can explain. Uh, Nine to five Mac, a new unpatchable exploit allegedly found on Apple's secure Enclave chip. That would be a very, very big deal. Pre yeah, previous versions. I, except were still that a big it's deal. not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't think anybody knows yet what the um, exploit is capable of doing. That's just been found. Period. That's it. But there's also um, it's something that the person actually would have to have the phone in their hands or have remote access to, to the phone in order to have remote access or well, have access to <clears throat> the secure enclave, which means, you know, it, it's a very big deal for a very small number of people out there. Uh, I would caution you on that one uh, because 
generally the really th the big threats are chains of exploits. And so, yeah. yeah, right now, if you wanted, we don't even know what exactly this exploit was. It was discovered by a Chinese hacking team. It's QWERTY, the, right? The Pangu team. Well, I think QWERTY team. posted it on Twitter. QWERTY? Oh, okay. It said yeah. Team Pangu has found an unpatchable vulnerability. However, uh, that would be the last step in an exploit chain. So you're right. Maybe the initial thing you'd have to be holding it in your hand. But... Maybe you could eventually get a drive-by malware attack that would then open up this possibility, that possibility to get to the point. As soon as you cracked something like the Secure Enclave, that is a real cause for concern, especially because well, it's hardware. Right? Ray, uh, what's their name? And then there's Cellbrite and the other companies yes, that specialize yes. in providing law enforcement with tools to break into stuff like that. Uh, what's stored in your Secure Enclave? Everything. I mean, important. that's the that's the keys to the kingdom. That's, that's it. Your hardware keys, <laughs> including your encryption your biometrics, keys. So if you got in the secure uh, enclave, hard information, you'd be able to decrypt the entire the contents of the entire yeah. phone. Uh, theoretically, I mean, we don't it, know. It's a huge black box, and they managed to peel away one layer of protection a couple of years ago, only to find that there was you know other stuff beyond the obfuscation. So we don't know what access they have or what they did, but. They're going to keep, especially the older chips, they're going to keep hammering on those. And I be, I forget what this was. Was this A11? It was 11. Earlier? It was A11 yeah. and earlier. So the, any any of the newer chips, which there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of phones that are on A11 and earlier. So that is a big deal. Yeah. But the 12, 13 and anything in the future won't be affected by Well, that's by really this. good news means you could, uh, you know, if you got something, anything later. If than you're really 10, worried, buy a new phone. Yeah. Even the new SE. Which is a horrible, but it's Would be workable. protected. Because it's using yeah. twelve. Yeah, I mean, it's not good though. You don't, you don't want these kinds of bugs to show up, and it's not the first time. So um, it's, you know, cause for concern. But yeah, they I, will though, and so I, it's just it, for me. It always depends how the company reacts to it. Like, what is the what is the exposure? What's the threat level? Who's at risk? How do they respond? And what are the right. options for people who need to need to not be in that threat? Lori's right. This probably is only of real concern to people for whom uh, nation states or law enforcement would want to yeah. <laughs> spend the energy and the time to uh, try to get into their stuff. Um, but it could conceivably new... become an exploit that's built into the next Cellbrite machine that the yeah. you know the Customs and Border Patrol has when Renee and Richie once again tries to get into our fair land. <laughs> well, no, but the funny thing is that always when they catch these people too, they have the oldest iPhones. <laughs> like they're, yeah. they're, they're, they, they seize these phones and it's always like, it's like an iPhone 4 or like an iPhone 5 or something. That's because being a terrorist just doesn't pay that well. <laughs> well, it, it's one of my favorite law enforcement quotes, right? We could, how did you catch them? A taillight. Turns out that, you know, yep. there's no amount of manpower yep. or money that equals the person being stupid. Yep. Speaking of stupid, <laughs> 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 have you been following the, uh, the Twitter hack? And they have now arrested oh. three uh, young men, the chief... Hacker, who's I'm not going to mention these guys' names uh, because yeah. it's always all alleged. Uh, but it was a very uh, detailed indictment, um, f and uh, the the chief hacker Kirk, as we called him, uh, turned out to be a 17 year old who had just graduated from high yeah. school. It's like, it's like oh a boy. Jay and Silent Bob movie. It's like it's so bizarre. <laughs> well, but, that, but, but that was but that was kind of expected. The the fact that they had something so valuable and they just basically took it to the pawn shop and took twenty dollars for it, uh, and also the fact that they're if if it was if they if motherboard was correct that they were talking to people who had actually committed this thing. That's exactly like 17, 18 year old kid mentality that it's not it's the, the getting money from it would be one thing. But there's no way you're 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 keeping your, your your mouth shut about something you thought that was really, really awesome that you managed to do. So, sure. well, and it was like their OPSEC was terrible. <laughs> they reused handles. Yeah. They actually yeah. the biggest thing I think that will be probably the evidence that will convict them. And by the way, the 17 year old is charged with 30 felonies and will be tried as an adult. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that will end up convicting him is he <laughs> used his driver's license to create oh, no. the Coinbase account, which you have to do, the Coinbase account mm -hmm. that he used uh, for storing all that Ill illegal gain. Um, <clears throat> so, and reused handles and all sorts of But we still don't know what accounts they downloaded, right? Like, we still don't know if this was all just Twitter some knows. thing where they... Yeah, Twitter, Twitter knows, knows I mean, but is know. not telling. Yeah. Twitter almost certainly has logs because they, notice they went from, oh, he downloaded the DMs from eight accounts to, oh, he downloaded the DMs from 36 accounts. 
I yeah. think the logs uh, tell all. Uh, we're going to learn more because the indictment is public. Uh, there's a lot of information. Motherboard did have uh, the most complete story, and they published names. I'm not going to mention names because, you and know, Twitter it's all. Be so thankful that it was such a, such a high school plot because it could have been so much worse. <laughs> yeah. And at least now they'll be under huge pressure to operate like an adult big big person company. Right. I hope so. This is not the first time Twitter has been hacked. Um, I hope they maybe they learn a lesson. From I was this. watching the latest half as interesting video about the seven people who have the keys to rebooting DNS and the, just like the elaborate security. Oh, yeah. The, isn't that, that fun? The key rotation but, but like, that's what Twitter ceremony. Have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Charlie Monroe, let's do this story because you were a little uh, you were talking about this before the show. Uh, Andy, who is Charlie yeah. Monroe? Uh, he is a develop uh, an Apple developer. He creates the really great utility Downy, uh, which is for downloading streaming videos that like aren't on Netflix, just things that are just open on the uh, on the net. Uh, and so uh, I found <laughs> I found out that uh, about a problem when I tried to uh, I, I restarted my Mac. Uh, I always have Downey like open. Uh, tried to relaunch Downey four. Said nope, sorry, nope, won't, won't launch. Uh, tried to relaunch Downey three. Wouldn't relaunch. Try, went to the website. See, well, maybe I have a corrupted version. Then the the download link on the web on Charlie Monroe's website goes to a 404 page. Uh, and the uh, when I looked at the console logs, the error was that this was a, a, there's a problem with the signature of this app. Then you go, I went down to look uh, at the look at this uh, dialog box that uh, somebody tweeted. Yeah. Downey 4 will damage your computer. You should move it to the trash. And then a box that says, report malware to Apple to protect other users. Because, yeah. so what happened? I, well, I got, I got, a, I emailed him this morning. I got what looks like a bulk email because obviously he's getting lots of emails. Hi, my developer account was suspended today without anyone telling me why. This is the cause why the apps are crashing as the signature certificates have been revoked. The downloads from the official site have been removed for the time being as they would not work anyway. Please bear with me as I try to get this fixed with Apple, which may take several days as I am receiving dozens of reports like yours every hour. Please not. Blah, blah, blah. Once it's fixed, a working download will be available for my website and please check my blog please check facebook please so this check is Twitter that notarization updates. thing we've talked about before if you're an apple developer and you want to distribute apps even if it's not in the app store yeah you have to submit the app to apple and they notarize it apparently they don't they don't uh, it's not clear what they do to give to notarize it. it they kind of imply that it's oh it's just an automated process but it's not fully automated are they vetting the apps? What are they? Are they looking at the apps more thoroughly? Well, what are they I don't doing? know. I, I noticed that. I noticed that Downey doesn't work. However, I also own another one of his apps called Permute, and that one launches just fine. Oh, interesting. And that one, I think I bought that from the, uh, from the App Store directly. Uh, the it's again, there is nothing but silence here uh, from Apple. We don't know exactly whether this was, as Renee said earlier, whether this was just a screw up and they'll fix the screw up or whether they're saying, oh, well, this is a naughty app. You're not supposed to be downloading videos that are meant to be streamed. We don't approve. And so yoink for you and yoink for your application. Uh, but if that is the case, Boy, that sucks, Apple. That's just such I a terrible thing. Here. And that's like, and so this is the reason that are weird here. Sorry, yeah. I think I'm out of I'm, I'm just, I'm all I'm, all I'm, all I was just, all, all I was going to say to wrap up is that this is what worries me the most about Apple gatekeeping. That if 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 Apple wants to control all the apps that are in the App Store, that's absolutely their right. But if I've spent fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars, thirty two thousand dollars on a Mac, you don't get to tell me that I can't run like a, an app from an independent developer on it. You certainly can't. You certainly aren't allowed to let me. Uh, excuse me. To uh, suddenly disconnect, turn off my access to an app that I've bought and paid for, I've been relying on day to day to day. That's just stupid, piggish behavior. Can't you just? Couldn't he so, distribute the app unnotarized, and then you would have to do the right click and open get, thing? Yeah. That's the whole thing is so weird is that like it's it's basically all that this is supposed to be is a train of trust to prove that this app comes from that developer. So it does two things. One, it proves that this app comes from the developer so that somebody can't make a fake malware version. They do scan for mal for malicious content. Yes. But right. it's like, you know, hacker B can't put up this app and say this is the same app and you'll confuse the two and that's download good. it and install it. I like that. And also if there is an app that's infected or if something happens like a 
like a developer cell or somehow like bad code gets put in a bad SDK or somehow like anything bad happens and they have to push that emergency button, which I think they've only done a couple of times. And it was in cases of imminent harm to users. The app can be, you know, remotely detonated or, or rendered null, <laughs> but it doesn't make sense in this case because, well, a couple of things don't make sense is usually that there's a back and forth, like even in cases where developers have had their accounts deleted, there was a huge paper chain of we think like, you're doing this fraud. We found 30 or four other apps under your name that are scamming people this way. And we've proven that it's you. And there's this huge public thing about it. This was like out of the blue, according to him. And also that that. Well, Apple can't talk about it without him because it's it's private. It's his information. They can tell him what happened. They just can't put out a statement right. and saying, oh, you know, this was blah, blah, blah. Uh, they have to go through him on this. But under no parameter for which this system is designed to work does it seem to have worked in this case, which is why I suspect that it was just a huge mess yeah, up. We should someone, point out. It's someone an, didn't sign a certificate somewhere. It's an automated system, according to Apple, which yes. means it could go wrong. Automated systems almost always go wrong at some point. So With the it's, speed of computers, it's, they can go it's, wrong. It's scanning for uh, malicious uh, content. It checks for code signing issues. It's possible that his certificate was compromised, and they detected that. Um, and so I think it would be prudent before worrying about gatekeeping because there's been no other example of Apple saying, oh, yeah, we're not going to notarize this. Or it could be like they tried to ban another app and accidentally hit his. Like there's so many levels of dumb that could have yeah. happened. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll this wait. This just happened today, right, Andy? Just happened today. Just happened this morning about 12 hours ago. Um, but it, it, it is disturbing that even if it's an automated mistake, that there is no automated email saying, hi, this right. is why the, this is why yes. you're going to have your, your 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 customers can't watch your apps today. What, uh, either way, it, it's it is possible, though, or correct me if I'm wrong. It was my understanding. I could write an app. Uh, and and have people download it, it would just get yep. that gatekeeper warning saying, we can't verify this app. Yes. Uh, and then yeah. you would have to right-click and select open from the menu, or you would have to turn off gatekeeper. There's ways around that. So he could distribute it without a notarization. Code signing, yeah. They haven't yet got to yeah. the point where you must be notarized to run on a Mac. No. Yeah, you, you can. It's an extra step, and I think by default it's not. like That little radio button isn't available by default like you can still do it but they don't make it a default option for you anymore iMore has a wonderful article uh, which talks about the uh, shell command you can issue to turn it back on uh, which I think is a good I mean I'm gonna I do that probably will always do that with any new Mac uh, I'll leave the default be leave gatekeeper on but if the fact that I could turn it off is a very nice feature and I you know I often I often download apps that I have to right click or command click and, and open manually once you do that once it's the last time I mean then it opens from then on yeah, yeah. so which I, I, which I always thought was the was the best way to go absolutely well, agree let, let me let it's it's the it's the best of uh, both worlds where Apple is giving its prudence and expertise saying that if we have no if we're not familiar with this developer there are certain risks involved but obviously if you're willing to go back do what we tell you which is to go back into system preferences and approve the launch of this app then it's not our it's not our our place to tell you not to launch an app yeah I'm just I'm just bummed because there's a, there's a streaming event tonight that I was not going to have time to watch and I I really wanted to like yeah. VCR it yeah. and so it looks like I'm going to have to miss it because <laughs> he could he uh, he absolutely could release it unnotarized I hope so he chose to I, do notarized uh, and and I think you would probably in a normal course of events just notarize it I, it costs you 99 bucks a year right. Mm. Is that right? All you need to do is pay for the Apple developer account and you can get it notarized. I think so, yeah. yeah. But but that's but does <laughs> something like this does like make you start that well maybe I shouldn't notarize my app. If I maybe I should just be the complete like <laughs> completely outside the the Apple app ecosystem if it means that again something can get screwed up and there can be an innocent mistake that nonetheless means that Hi, I'm on deadline, and this tool that I absolutely rely on to <laughs> to make things work, if because of a mistake, is down for two or three days for absolutely no adequately explained reason. So it's just an inconvenience for me. But if it were for if it were like a big problem for someone else, if there was like a, a statistical analysis app saying that, hey, I'm, I, I, I don't get to report the news like two days late, but thank you very much anyway. I download. I would say every week I download an app that I have to right click open. Yeah, uh, just maybe that's the nature of my of this kind of stuff I'm playing with, but that's very common, yeah, uh, for me anyway. And I don't mind doing that, but I could see nope. if you wanted to have a more 
a polished app or more commercially viable app that you might say, well, I got to have it notarized. But then that's the downside. Then if it gets revoked, <laughs> if this starts to happen a lot, then I don't think anybody's going to notarize. So that's the other reason that Apple might want to act quickly. It's also scary for people, like people who aren't very technologically savvy. They rely on these things right. to tell them what's safe to download or not. And they hear horror stories about people getting malware and viruses right. when they download off the and, and some of those sites, like download, like all those those free software download sites, are scary as hell. It's damaging you fill your to screen with 800 Yahoo toolbars. It's damaging to his reputation because people are inevitably yeah. going to connect that message with Downey. Ooh. That's not good. So I would hope Apple will quickly respond. And we've seen, like, it's, not, it's totally not the same thing, but we've had several times, like it happened on iMore too, where something happened with a certificate and our site was said, Google declared our site had malware. Right, right. And couldn't get to That's it and we had good. to try to find somebody to fix it. And it's yeah, just, yeah. yes, it's super protective, but if you're ever on the wrong side of it. Right, right. Well, that's the downside of strong security. New yeah. iPhone uh, will not be coming out until October. Apple actually said this in the analyst call, right? Lori, mm -hmm. did you were you on the phone on the horn? Yeah, I, w I was like, wait, what? What? Hey, somebody hey, write what? that. <laughs> Luca Maestri, the uh, CFO, said, as you know, last year we started selling the new iPhone in late September. This year we project supply to be available a few weeks later, i.e. October. Not unprecedented, though. No. And, and not a surprise. I mean, the fact yeah. that they even have anything coming, anything in the pipeline is kind of like a big deal. They're they're keeping going with it even without, right. even with the, the issues with the pandemic and the supply line and everything. So a few weeks later is, if they just said by November, I would have been like, yeah, okay, that, right. that's... You know, I it's before Christmas, live. so they're doing their I'll job. I'll survive. Yeah. I like my and iPhone 11. Rumor that the, there's a weird rumor that the 6.1-inch ones, the 6.1-inch normal and 6.1-inch pro will come out first, and then the baby and the and the, the giant one will come out later. But that's that just seems weird. <laughs> which which one do I want, Renee? <laughs> I kind of hope I kind of hope they do though because the years where they had staggered launches were so much easier for us to do reviews. That's like, true. Thinking purely selfishly, yeah. it was worse for consumers. But just like in terms of reviews, it's easier to do one thing at this a time. This started when the 10R. Four things at a time. This started when the 10R came out later. The 10. Um, the 10 came out a month after. The 10 the did. That's right. The 10 yeah. came out, mm -hmm. and then the 10R the next year, and that was the most popular yeah. iPhone. And they've kind mm -hmm. of done that all along now with these, uh, like the SE, I don't even know. That came out six months later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, so what, you, you think it will be, which will be available first, the premium ones or the less premium ones? Well, the rumor says one premium, one non-premium, both the same size, which I just find odd. Those screens may be more readily available. Well, the, the regular one has the second-class OLED screen, not the latest, greatest oh, Samsung screen. Okay. But I think they, they tried BOE, and that didn't work out. So now they're with LG, or they're back with an older Samsung. And uh, how big process. is the big one going to be? Six point what? Six point seven, I think. <laughs> yeah. Is that bigger go, than the, the Pro big. Max? How big yeah, is the Pro Max? Yeah, a little bit bigger. Wow. And the regular one's going to be a little bit smaller. So they're, going, they're changing on both ends. Unbelievable. How does Apple do it? And we, the leak for that was so funny because uh, there's been no display zoom on the regular side. Like the iPhone 10, iPhone uh, 10s, and iPhone 11 Pro had no display zoom because there was no interface size smaller than them that they could just scale up for accessibility. Oh. And now in iOS 14, that interface is there. So people just like, oh, I wonder how big it is. Let's just measure. iOS 14 <laughs> won't be delayed, right? Yeah, it's come out at the same time as the phones, I think. So right. it'll come out in October instead of September. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Not at, it's usually, not at the announcement. It's usually two days. The, the Gold Master usually comes at the announcement, and then the, the shipping version, the general release, uh, two days before the phones hit the... Like, usually the Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday before the phones come out on Friday. Bloomberg reports Apple just bought Moby Wave. Don't know if this means anything. It's a startup that allows phones to become payment terminals. So uh, this is maybe Apple trying to compete with Square? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Renee said, the, the, the uh, Apple hardware as a POS uh, device is the unsung hero of the product line. Uh, the number of times you interact with an iPad, the number of times you interact with an iPhone or even a Mac, uh, that's a very, that's, it's, it's, it's not like health in terms of Apple's uh, investing in making sure that part of its business uh, is this really really nice nice growth market but it makes a very it makes a whole lot of sense for them to go into pos more 
Ewan McGregor is the <laughs> new Apple TV Plus star. He will ride an electric Harley through South America. But not as Obi-Wan. That guy thinks he's cool. Yeah. Is he going to have that weird <laughs> little beard thing that he had? <laughs> Probably. Yes, he, he's done this before. He, he has a couple of different motorcycling like uh, uh, travel shows. Yeah. And they're all like pretty amazing. The music is pretty incredible. So this is this is a pretty interesting get for them. I like it. They're going to ride the Anakin. live wires, those electric uh, Harleys. That's, that's yeah. pretty Anakin, cool. I have the high ground. That's all I gotta keep hearing. <laughs> they're going to start in Ushaya, which is all the way down. And then they're going to go all the way up to Mexico. So that's going to be quite a ride from the tip of South America yeah. all the way up to Mexico. Uh, kind of like easy ride. What do they do? They Gilded stop and eat food. And it's a reality show, right? I haven't seen yeah. these. And, so it, and it's it's very it's very off the cuff. It, it looks like something that like he could have been shoot. He and his friends could be shooting himself. So yeah, because it's, not it's like, from 2019. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's not it's not like a Michael Palin uh, documentary where there's a big crew that's following around and uh, they. Okay. And now now let's now let's go to this arranged thing to see this part of uh, this this part of uh, of culture. It really is a very back of it's like it's like you're riding on the back of his motorcycle. Your arms wrapped tightly around his torso. Ooh. So You're giving me you chills. Motor you can smell his high Get up on the You're giving me chills. Looking for adventure. Come uh, on, uh, Oprah Winfrey, Apple TV Plus, Oprah Winfrey, Apple News Plus, blah, blah, blah. Um, she's going to be guest editor for Apple News. I didn't know they were going to have guest editors. What does that even mean? I don't know. I want Andy to be a guest editor. I do too. Set some, some, set some hearts straight. Yes. The, the press release we got yesterday was that cast the origins of our discontents is the is, no wait a minute that's not the new book wait a minute let me look at these press releases once again <laughs> the oprah books club book of the week i get i get mine on telegram did you know you can do that there's a telegram bot that will send you apple press releases it's so awesome the apple PR i wish they could get bot. me a burger i want I telegram's bots to get I me know. a burger Oh, yeah, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, now available on Apple Books. Winfrey narrates an exclusive excerpt in a new video and will be the first ever guest editor for Apple News. Winfrey's conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author Isabel Wilkerson will debut this fall for free on Apple TV+. Plus. Like I said, Oprah Winfrey, blah, 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 blah. Um, wow. Warren Buffett, thirty-five billion dollars stake in Apple, <laughs> worth one hundred four billion now. Nice move, hmm. Warren. Good for him. Why, he's he's nice not a move. dummy. No dummy. Did Glad you to see, see things finally go his way for once? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, here's one that this this actually raises the uh, interesting challenge for the Apple App Store on iOS. Microsoft has a new uh, streaming gaming uh, project that I think will be very popular called xCloud. $15 a month to get 100 games. It'll be available September 15th, Microsoft announced, but not on iOS. Yep. And that's because of iOS policies, right? App Store policies. Yep. Um, they've been testing xCloud on iOS, but they revealed their testing was limited due to Apple's App Store policies. You can't get Google Stadia on iPhones or iPads either. Oh. Took uh, and Apple a long time. About it too. Yeah, it took Apple a long time to get to let get Valve on there. Um, is it the thirty percent? Is it Apple putting up a roadblock? They block? have a rule against other app stores. Like you can't have an app store on the App Store. Basically, is the rule. Like, I don't think they, maybe you know, obviously they care about thirty percent because money. But you know, they're based. The, the higher level rule here is no app stores on app stores, which I'm sure makes sense in some previous world. You know, where you, you didn't want to have someone shady doing something. Yeah. But this is this is the future. This is clearly how all this stuff is going to work from now on. That's what I was talking about when I was saying in, initially the app store made sense, policy made sense. But yeah. as the edge cases start to emerge, this is an edge mm -hmm. case. Here is a company. A kind of well-known company. Maybe you heard of them, Microsoft. Yeah. With, might own TikTok soon. <laughs> yeah, and uh, might own TikTok. And they, uh, Microsoft says, look, we want to have this. And I would say many gamers would want this. What, yeah. This this X X Cloud on on the iOS store, but we don't want to give you thirty percent, or we don't. And 
This what's could be a problem, I think, for Apple. On the store, right? But like, what's the difference between having this and having HBO Go or HBO Now on right. this, where you can open up a place and ch choose a movie? You open up a place and you choose a game. It what is a subscription. Really is You're not buying individual games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is a $15 a month subscription, uh, although there will be in-app purchase capabilities. So maybe that's... And Microsoft is all in on this. Like, I think everything that they showed off at their last event every was single X Cloud program. enabled. Every Game single Pass, right, program. Enabled. Yeah, every single game. Um, there, so. there, there are multiple services that are going, going in on streaming games. Uh, the, the, the number of... It's, it's one of the... I, I've read that's one of the reasons why there's... A, one of the many reasons why there's a certain shortage on video certain kinds of video acceleration hardware because they're being bought like by the hundreds, by the thousands to be put into servers. Because they're going to run them so you don't have to. And I think this would All be such... All the old such, Bitcoin mines are such, going yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> This would be such an asset to have on an, an iPad. And surely yeah. Apple sees that. It really is. Microsoft yep. wants to be there, I'm sure. Like it would instantly make Apple TV eight times more valuable. Oh, good point. Yeah. Didn't even yeah. think of that. Well, this this was this was also something that I was that I was thinking about earlier that it is possible to get access to uh, uh, to uh, a, a Windows server and essentially run desktop Windows on any device, including an iPad Pro. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Apple just simply made that made that available as an app or a Mac OS as a service, and or at least just let some sort of favored company develop this on their own? Because I can see absolutely the argument for we don't want to blur the lines between the iPad and the Mac, but imagine the utility that uh, the the extra value that you would have into a into an iPad if you had the ability to run those few apps that there really is no desktop equivalent. Uh, excuse me, there is no mobile equivalent for iPad. I would buy. I would pay fifteen bucks a month for that in a heartbeat. It yeah. could be that the the reason they're not launching it on iOS right away is a rollout like maybe they're gonna run it on android for a while until all the android people want it and then they'll run it out to apple products it's just because if they did both companies all at once it might be too many devices for for their their cloud service to handle it and we've heard of this before where companies will roll out something to all devices and suddenly it crashes pokemon go is an example of that and yeah. so maybe they're just being smart about it Could and be. doing it bit by bit yeah. instead of trying to jump in all at once and then have a bad user experience. You're for right. People. I shouldn't impute there's some sort of problem with the app store. It could very yeah, it could be, that. or it could just be, they're just, they're just yeah. doing one, then, then, then another. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. And we do, and we really know that Microsoft is all in on iPad and Mac. I mean, they love it. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're doing it before and they're the doing Xbox. their own hardware many times. Yeah. Xbox controller is supported on iOS and yeah. tvOS so you know there's the the pathway is there for this to happen on Apple products it's just a matter of how soon they can get it done yeah yeah all right let's take a little break and then I think it would be a good time I think for us to have our picks of the week what do you think oh what about anti that's a Leo? Good idea. you've got to at least mention it Oh, I didn't mention the four CEOs walk into a bar. <laughs> so can I can I just say that before this happened, I put up a tweet very specifically that said my guesses were tech support requests, maybe <laughs> conspiracy theories, and someone would mess up the mute button, and all three of those things turned out to be true. Uh, Mr. Bezos, so. I think you're on mute. That's one. Can we have can we have <laughs> well, a um, antitrust hearing bingo next time around where <laughs> each one of those are on a card and we can hopefully win and our Tim bingo. Cook. Tim Cook was like Gina from when she put on Amy's clothes on Brooklyn Nine-Nine so nobody would see her. It was like completely no saturated. You turned away like, and, they, and they forgot about him for like 40 minutes. They did. It worked. Amazing. They really focused yeah. on uh, Bezos and Pichai uh, or Pinch. What did he call him? Peachy? <laughs> what, <laughs> why did you ban people? Why did you ban people on Twitter, sir? I own Facebook, sir. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's well. Re, re, let's, it's it bears mentioning that this wasn't just a, a grandstand sort of trial sort of uh, uh, event. This is the result of one year of investigation, yes. in which a million documents were turned over, and every and yeah, there were some quote some cringeworthy questions, but a lot of them were super super pointed in, in terms of Tim Cook, particularly about you know how do you control the app store? Why do what about these allegations in which in which uh, you were banning apps that compete with a uh, 
uh, with Apple apps. Uh, what about these? This testimony from these developers that say that essentially they're you you own a monopoly on uh, on iPhone apps and you're uh, exercising that unfairly. He didn't get beat up nearly as badly, obviously, as Facebook and yeah. Google and Amazon did because they're not that's that sort of business. But nonetheless, this wasn't uh, this this isn't like when they hauled uh, uh, when they hauled Zuckerberg uh, after the Cambridge Analytica thing, uh, where it's like okay, well we have to be seen to be doing something. We are Congress. We're going to bring him in and then think about what you're doing. No, this is essentially when, when they when they bring you in when they ask you to come in voluntarily to talk about where you were on a certain night and where and and do you have any witnesses of that? You know that okay. In the next couple of weeks, I'm, there's probably going to be either an arrest warrant or I'm going to have to turn turn witness against somebody. This was really really serious heavy stuff. Mike? My and concern, though, is that even the the competent people, like it, it, yeah, it, it, things aside from like Eric Schmidt talking himself into paying eight times more for YouTube than he had to just by weight. I mean, there was such hilarity in a lot of that stuff. But they came in basically on the premise that these companies were so big that they were a threat to the country, and then they proceeded to litigate not that like other things that are certainly yeah. problematic, but that weren't along the lines of those of that stated theory, except for the cockamamie conspiracy theories. And then at the end, he just gets up gavels and says, it's obvious you're too big, break up. And it just, it seemed to me like there was like, uh, no one was this writing isn't this the end linear game. narrative. As Andy's pointing out, there is gonna be a report. This was just kind of the pro forma, okay, look, we got a lot of stuff on you guys. And we did learn a lot. There were a lot of emails. Yeah. Uh, it was like Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt, like should you really hold Sund uh, Sundar Pichai like culpable for some of the things that Eric Schmidt, like the, the comedy of Eric Schmidt? Basically, well, but there's you know, also still, some, some, you know, because of, you know, the uh, emails about uh, Kindle pricing and, you know, uh, why iOS users can't buy Kindle books. It's revealing about the App Store. For I, us, it was great. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff in there. There's a report. It's going to come out at maybe end of this year, maybe next year from this. This is the antitrust subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, they will have recommendations. I think this was more kind of a pro forma, okay, well, let's ask these guys. But they have a lot of material. They've obviously yeah. been gathering. Jeff doesn't run Amazon. He doesn't know what's happening there. He yeah. told you that. Uh, he yeah, said, I don't know. It could happen. It <laughs> certainly big, would be against the rules. The, yeah. yeah. The, big the, the big deal about this is is that there is going to be a report from the head of the committee later this month, and it's going to be the first of just a, of, of a bunch of them. But the big deal is that a lot of the money and a lot of effort was spent to, to amass all of this evidence that now Congress can refer to and rely upon and exactly. analyze when it comes to deciding do we need to put further controls, or excuse me, exactly. new controls upon these industries and these companies? And there'll so be, this is, this is, there'll be so discussions. We, we shouldn't downplay this. There'll be yep. discussions about, for instance, forcing Facebook to, to get disgorge uh, Instagram. There'll be, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. That's it will the scary also, thing, though. Well, I'm not saying that'll happen. There's, there, no, like no, but I mean, like, they're a blunt weapon. Like, like I have no, like, it's so to me, if I was any of these CEOs, regardless of the comedy that went on, I would be scared out of my mind. I know some people think that nothing's going to come of this, but they have proven, like them in the EU, that it's basically random chance what they do to you. And the their understanding of the technology and the markets is nothing that I would ever want to rely on. I would do, like, if I was Apple, I would offer, I would immediately offer alternate payment programs Make sure that apps that don't need to be on an iPhone aren't like you've got to download them from the app store. Make sure that Clips isn't using any API that isn't available. To, like, and if I was Google, I'd make sure I never yelped or 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 like gurued, rap gurued anything like that again. If I was all of these companies, I would find the specific things that hurt me the less, but disarm them the most, and I would do them instantaneously. Just to the avoid. only but thing I would point to in this is uh, the Microsoft DOJ hearings of the 90s and while at the time it really seemed like a complete circus uh and maybe even a witch hunt and i think there i remember at the time many of us thought exactly what you're saying Renee, yeah. which is that lawmakers and congress work at a different speed than technology but i think you can also now in hindsight 20 years later look back and say you know it would be a very different Microsoft today if they hadn't had that slap, if they weren't forced, for instance, and this might be one of the things that they, if you look at what the judgment was, I thought it was actually, and I reread it uh, recently because of this, it actually was pretty well-founded. And it did, in fact, persuade Microsoft uh, to be a kind of a different company. They had three yeah. in-house ombudsmen watching what they were doing. They got to review all the records. There was a lot of regulatory stuff compliance. that's compliance yeah. stuff that I don't think was an undue burden that I think actually 
help Microsoft be a better company in the long run and was good for the computer industry in the long run mm -hmm. and the technology industry. I think you can make the argument we wouldn't have the, 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 the landscape we have today if it weren't for DOJ Microsoft in 1998. So I think there is a roadmap for this that shows it can be done judiciously, appropriately, thoughtfully. And I don't think anybody would would say, well, these, co I mean, look, being big by, and they even said this, being big by and of itself is not a crime, but we, there are privacy concerns, there are antitrust concerns, there are market dominance concerns that can be, I think, reasonably it turns addressed. real business, like normal business, into a crime, though. Like you can do almost everything uh, that they are accused of doing when you're small. Absolutely, you any of that's, that that's, well, that's, but that's, well, that's the because, way it should be. That's the law. Yeah. Yes. That's that's be, that's because you know I can I can throw a wadded up piece of paper at somebody and I'll get away with it. But if I shoot a gun at somebody, that's a much bigger yes. deal. It's, the thing is, it, it, it's absolutely correct that if at, when a business at scale decides that I here is a here is a competing message platform that does something that is that because of our ability to eavesdrop on our users through our quote free VPN app, we have determined that they're yes. gee they're using this WeChat thing instead of Facebook Messenger. We need to buy WeChat to make sure that we keep these users in our own ecosystem. That's obviously in a abuse of power. That's something you, that you can't just write a check. Instead of competing with WeChat, you, you're big enough that you can just simply write a check and own WeChat. So uh, what, what's, what you're saying, Renee, I think, I think is exactly the ideal sort of outcome where uh, it, when uh, there's a, when there's a, a uh, when there is a, usually when there is a discrepancy between what the government wants and what the industry wants, the best outcome or the usual outcome is a negotiation between the two where we don't have to pa ask Congress to pass a law to make what you did illegal. We, we can just make you agree, have you agreed that that was a bad thing and you don't want us to bring the hammer down on you, no less than we yeah. want to bring the hammer down on you, on you either. The fact that there is pressure now from above saying that Perhaps you should rethink your app store policy. Perhaps you should rethink your acquisition of this app. Perhaps you we, you should rethink the idea of again uh, making competing with your with your uh, an up and coming competitor uh, by trying to underprice them and make make poison the market against them so that you will survive the storm that you create, but your competitor will not. Once you realize there's skin in the game, what we, we, we get down to, to the basics of is that it's, it's like that line from The Simpsons that, hey, we've been trying nothing and we've we tried nothing and now we're totally out of ideas. We want we're at the point where we have given these industries very little regulation as opposed to just requests and guidelines. And oh, we'll 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 get the FTC on you if you screw up. We don't want to have to legislate these industries, we, but we need to have some pressure on them so that you can no longer do whatever you want. You can no longer simply say what is in the best interest of Apple. You have to simply say, is this OK for us to do? Are we going to make sure that the next Apple, the next Microsoft, the next Google, the next Facebook uh, provide an environment in which these people can actually uh, create new industries and new markets? It's You can't really tell now. What it, but but I, that's why I point out the Microsoft DOJ case, because we can yep. look back now and say, you know, it wasn't very popular at the time. People love Microsoft. And, and, and I remember we, put, we, you know, oh, this is stupid browser ballots in Europe and things like that. These are dumb kind of governmental uh, and Google was coming anyway and all these things. Yeah, but I don't think Google would have been coming anyway. Um, there was a really good uh, editorial in the New York Times a couple of years ago by uh, Senator Dick Blumenthal and Tim Wu, who uh, is really uh, good on this. And in it, they say the enduring lesson of the Microsoft case was that keeping markets open can require a trust buster's courage to take decisive action, even against a very popular monopolist. And, you know, they say, would we've had a Google? Would we have Facebook? Would we have Netflix? Maybe not with a do completely dominant Microsoft. So, the thing that impressed me so much that I didn't think – when it, going into this, I thought it was a mistake for them to bring all four together at once. And I still think it was probably a mistake. But the thing that I thought was really well done, and maybe it was accidental, I don't know at this point, was that they showed a common linkage in the areas of concern. And that is how they treat the – third parties who are dependent That's upon right. them for marketplace right. and how they treat competitors that are not peers. And in all four of those cases, that treatment was, was, and you, again, you can decide based on their size, whether it's abusive or not. I'm sure the government will, but time after time, every single one of them had problematic relationships with the people who depended on them and problematic relationships with the companies they wanted to buy or they were competing with. That, that diapers.com story 
is the textbooks too. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know what? The truth is maybe we're inured to it because we've all known this has been going on all along. These are not new stories no to news. us. People were so freaked out, but every one of these stories that come out before, we it was just seeing the receipts. Yeah. That was so damning. Yeah, time. we knew. And we're just now seeing the smoking gun emails, but we, we knew, knew this yeah. was happening. So, I, you know, I understand everybody's reluctance to get government to weigh in on these things. But at the same time, I think there is a, there is a place for it. And there is a history of this being beneficial. Um, I don't know if you can use the AT&T case. I don't know if you can use the U.S. Steel well, they're case. They're fine. <laughs> but I, but the I, railroads, people are saying the railroads. And like because the railroads, it made sense for the person who was selling Coca-Cola on the uh, at the train, like you know, at the station, that they eventually the train would sell Coca-Cola on the train. But they got into every business and right. took over everything until, exactly. they were, until these exactly. laws came up. So it's very interesting, but it's going to be a year at least uh, half a year before we see any outcome of this. I actually, <laughs> I was prepared for the worst, having seen the Mark Zuckerberg Senate testimony. <laughs> I was prepared for the worst. It w wasn't quite as bad as I thought it would be. These guys have been, and gals have been working on this for a long time. Yeah, there were the Jim Jordans and the Jim <laughs> Sensenbrenners. There were the, you know, Sensenbrenner accused Mark Zuckerberg of taking down Donald Trump Jr.'s COVID post. And, and Mark said, well, actually, that was Twitter. But <laughs> so there was that that happened. But there, but I was actually impressed by the the depth of knowledge. I think the, the staff worst did a part lot were of the work. people who made the cockamamie conspiracy theories for the first three oh. rounds and then asked Kojic questions <laughs> oh. for the last round, which meant they could have asked Kojic questions I the whole know. time. That was just an act. Yeah. But th th that's the other thing with these televised hearings. There's a lot of grandstanding. You, you, we've come to expect that. This is just the way the sausage gets made in the United States. Um, I think it would actually, I thought it was better than I thought it was going to be. But we'll wait and see what the upshot of it is. Yeah. It's, t it's, it's so, a tough thing to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I watched all five. I, I, oddly enough, I used Downey to download the download mm -hmm. the video and then watch it at 2x speed so I could watch the entire smart thing. Smart man. And, and the, smart. The, most, the most boring parts of it were probably the most damning the, and probably the most Exactly. And the most exciting things were, yeah. put your mask on! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> put your mask yeah. on. Everybody put your and mask then, on. And then his response, talk about masks. Why are we masking oh, this whole thing? Wasn't that hysterical? Like, oh, for God's sake. Jim, put your jacket on, then put your mask on. Yeah. Uh, one last story. We'll a little uh, palate cleanser before, before we get <laughs> to the picks. <laughs> SpaceX, the uh, uh, Crew Dragon land landed. Uh, Endeavor, Yay. very. I know we all watched it on uh, on Sunday. I watched it; was great. Did you know though that the uh, the uh, SpaceX astronauts used AirDrop to troubleshoot a problem on their way in? Did you know that? Apparently, they use an iPad Mini, multiple iPad Minis, for their uh, spaceflight manuals. And at one point, <laughs> um, an astronaut read out an error message on his Mini. Uh, he said, a timeline application on my app, a tablet, uh, gives me an error message that says, <laughs> see if you've ever heard this one, Safari cannot open the page. <laughs> uh, and then it's got an HTML address because your iPad is not connected to the uh, internet. Uh, can you uh, confirm the Wi-Fi is off and the airplane mode is on? Asks the SpaceX <laughs> command. And then uh, the astronaut uh, this is my favorite part. Let's see. It's Bob. Bob. It was Doug and Bob. The McKenzie brothers were up there. Yeah. No, it was Bob Benkin. The astronaut says, uh, yeah, the Wi-Fi is off and the airplane mode is on. If you have display cameras up, I'll try to show it to you. So we, uh, they tried to show it to the cameras. Uh, when you're coming up on the ground station, we have the display camera up. Dragon SpaceX, can you bring that a little closer? We've got a good image of that. Uh, we're going to get back to you. Uh, just to be clear, is this just happening on your tablet, Bob, not on Doug's? Yeah, it's just on mine. Uh, eventually, <laughs> I love this, um, Bob uh, used AirDrop so good. to fix it. SpaceX uh, command requested that Doug tame screenshots of his day timeline as a backup in case his app experienced the same caching issue. Then each astronaut was instructed to briefly turn on Wi-Fi to enable airdrop so they could wirelessly share the screenshots between iPads. Apparently, they're storing the mission-critical documentation in Adobe Acrobat. Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, somebody's got to use it. Uh, Couldn't Elon turn I, on Starlink for them? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Starlink would have been helpful. Um, so that's uh, that was a little it's problem. It's funny because... The year they announced Air, uh, AirDrop, a, f a friend of mine, um, Martin, uh, is safe solvent. We were flying back from WWDC. He was our camera person at WWDC, and we were on a plane but opposite sides of it, and we needed to get some work done, and we figured out we'd try it. We didn't think it would work because we were in the air, but we didn't realize it's just Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and we were close enough that we were sending stuff back and forth. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that and awesome? And it, it, was, it was workflow changing. I'm just glad to know AirDrop works even in the uh, Crew Dragon. <laughs> That's all good. Talking Bob made it back. They're safe, they're healthy, and uh, it sure was fun to watch airdrop at work. Uh, let's take a little break. When we come back, I think we should get picks of the week. What am I going to spend my money on this week, Lori Gill? But, <laughs> but first, I better make some money. A uh, word from our sponsor, ZipRecruiter. We love ZipRecruiter. We've hired by, a lot of our staff members got hired by ZipRecruiter. John, you're one of the few who didn't because I think I hired you before there was even existed a zip recruiter <laughs> zip recruiter has transformed how we do hiring if you're a company that's currently trying to hire of course you're facing a whole bunch of new difficulties uh, but zip recruiters customers are happy and they're happy to tell the world housing wire good example they needed to hire an ambitious reporter to cover news stories on the housing markets in the u.s uh who else zip recruiter uh, to the rescue that's how housing wire found this new reporter alexandra roja uh, Alexandra hadn't really even thought about the fact that she might get a job at Housing Wire. She figured there was no way she could get a reporter job while everybody's in quarantine. But she created a profile on ZipRecruiter, put her resume up there. And this is when ZipRecruiter's magic happens because they use matching technology to match the resumes, the profiles they have on file with the jobs people post there. ZipRecruiter noticed Alexandra had the perfect degree in writing skills for Housing Wire's reporting job. They said, Alexandra, you should apply for this. She did. Housing Wire got her application. All of this happened within four hours of them posting the job. A few weeks later, she started her dream career. It's a happy ending for both Housing Wire and Alexandra Roja. It's a great story. This is why ZipRecruiter works so well for us. In fact, I could tell you again and again when we've used ZipRecruiter, we've got qualified applicants, more than qualified, great applicants within hours of our posting. It's kind of remarkable. Let ZipRecruiter help you hire. You'll see why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. In many cases, within just a few hours. Lisa posted uh, our bookkeeper job at breakfast. She's at, by lunchtime. She's going. Oh, here's another good one. Oh, here's another one. We could, they were just rolling in. Try it now for free. ZipRecruiter.com/slash/MacBreak. ZipRecruiter really works, and I'm testament that I we've done so much hiring with ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com/slash/MacBreak. ZipRecruiter, the smarter way to hire. Little program note. Uh, Twit After Hours is back this Friday. I'm very excited. We are going to do, by popular demand, once again, our Shelter in Kitchen episode. It's Twit's own live cooking show. Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Micah Sargent, no longer contested. He will now host. However, our winner from last time, Aunt Pruitt, is back. He'll be faced off against Lou Maresca from Twyatt and Ham Nation's Amanda Alden. The packages containing their mystery ingredients have already been shipped to them. And we're bringing in celebrity judges this time, Michael Wolf and Matthew Amster Burton. Two actual chefs will be coming on to judge the victors and the vanquished. Watch to see who will come out on top and who will flame out as the hosts have 30 minutes to cook up three bizarre mystery ingredients. It is, it is always popular, always fun. Shelter and Kitchen this Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern at twit.tv slash live or on our YouTube live channel. Well worth catching. Let's, uh, you know, I'm going to start with you, Lori. That way I'll have time to order whatever it is I need to buy. <laughs> Not this time. No? Not this time. No, actually what I wanted to tell everyone about is uh, the YouTube channel channel by Emmanuel Acho. Um, it's called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. 
And um, it's an Oprah book pick. (laughs) Yeah, it's a pretty impressive. uh, They're uh, 15 minutes long at the most. They're usually 10 or so minutes long. And it's um, Emmanuel Acho just really talking about the kinds of things that we as white folks don't really understand. And you, you, I think you've, we've heard this all before. You know, we have our one black friend that we go to to right. like answer all of our questions. Right. And like, that's not the way the world works. And, and Emmanuel Acho, he is our stand in of that friend. And he says, you can ask me those uncomfortable nice. conversations and nice. I'll try to answer them as best I can. And frankly, from, from my perspective, it's it's the perfect entry way into understanding the issues with with Black culture and with what's going on with everything, not just with Black Lives Matter, but with just existing as a Black human being. Things that a lot of times I know, I've heard this before. A lot of times I'm surprised. I had no idea. Um, issues with with just what it's like to just kind of like exist, and you can ask the or. You can ask these questions, yes, but um, he will just also answer these questions, even if they seem inappropriate to ask somebody. He will answer those questions. He he brings them up and he points them out. Even little things like, is it okay for a white person to have dreads? Things that you don't think, either you ask your black friend and they roll their eyes at you for, because come on, they're not the only black person in the entire universe, figure it out for yourself. But also you might not have wanted to ask that of your friend. So he answers those questions. There's some really powerful ones. There's some that are lighthearted and fun. I think he also, he interviews a lot of uh, well-known um, uh, well, uh, not a lot because it hasn't been around for that long, but a couple of well-known um, uh, uh, p- uh, people, actresses and actors and, um, you know, kind of famous people and things like that. Uh, Matthew McConaughey um, it, it has one episode. Um, my personal favorite episode, though, if you want to sit down and start crying, <laughs> is um, the, the, epi- the episode number, uh, does he, yeah, episode six, he does talk about it. It is a interracial family, um, two white parents, and they're, um, a, they're, they have one white-born child, or one blood-born white child, and then three children of mixed race or black children. And the the uh, the way the world is is encapsulized in this tiny little family. So it's one that kind of gives you goosebumps and makes you cry and makes you really look at things differently. So I do recommend episode six of of uh, uncomfortable conversations with the black man with um, Emmanuel Acho. Very powerful. Have you heard uh, yet the New York Times podcast sixteen nineteen? Yes, I've read a lot of the articles on that project. The articles too. were it, great. Yeah, uh, but the yeah. podcast I liked it because it shows uh, how far this medium can go to mm-hmm. really be informative. Um, it it's the companion to their 1619 piece. The year 1619 was the year the first enslaved Africans were brought to the United States. 400 years of uh, you know chattel slavery uh, in the United States uh, last year, and um, but the podcast to me was such an eye opener. And so powerful. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, those articles are good too. I mean, they did a really nice job. It's just nice to see podcasts be used for more than just a bunch of yeah. white folks sitting around <laughs> talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> about, about expensive computers. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be looking at this YouTube uh, uh, series. Emmanuel. Don't do it right uh, before you're about to. Record I know. Anything, I'm you crying. Will start listening crying to 1619. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. It's just. It's painful. Uh, but conversations that need to be have, had. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not sure the best way to find this, maybe search for uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, it, it's hugely popular. So if you just typed in the world uncomfortable conversation, hands, uh, chances are anybody's search will find it. It's really popular. Yeah. So It's nice to see all the views. It's good. Uh, Mr. Andy Hanatko, your pick of the week. Uh, last week we were talking about uh, Skype Helper, <laughs> the uh, how, yeah. why Skype <laughs> oh, is yeah. up so many so many resources, uh, and is there, is there any way to fix this? And it got me sort of it reminded me that I'm not spending enough time looking at the processes that uh, that are uh, that are affecting my Mac. And so I downloaded a really cool uh, activity from the uh, activity monitor app from the App Store called iStatistica Pro. Uh, which I tried two or three, and this is my favorite one. This looks really uh, good. I've never heard very, this. Very, 
It's a very, very pretty dashboard for one thing. So it's, 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 it is something that you would keep on your second. I, I keep it. I've kept it on my second monitor now for a full week. And I can tell you that the Skype helper app is consuming 91 percent of my CPU. Sometimes <laughs> the, the, the graph goes all the way up to 120 something percent of my CPU. Uh, it's, it's using six gigabytes of virtual RAM. Just when you when you start, it's it's and it will monitor pretty much everything. Got the, your processor, memory, disk access, network. Uh, Bluetooth, graphics processor, disk I.O. Uh, if you download a, an extra plugin for the app, I will also they you will, it will also give you access to uh, the sensors. Like on my Mac Mini, I can tell you that my CPU is running at 179, 181 degrees Fahrenheit. The exhaust fan is running at 5487 RPM. Uh, and it sounds like, oh, okay, great, you're just rattling off numbers. But this is the sort of thing where, particularly when it's being displayed to you as, as graphs, particularly when you get something as cool as the the summary panel that really is like one, two, it, it actually cap, copies the Apple Watch's uh, uh, circles uh, <laughs> circles interface. So you can actually, out of the corner of your eye, start to see, oh my God, what's going on in my Mac right now? Uh, whereas before you'd see, gee, why are, things, why are things so sluggish right now? And you might think that, oh geez, I need to upgrade my Mac because I don't know why things are going so slow. I don't know why I need to upgrade my internet connection because I don't know why my internet connection is, is, uh, is so bad. You can actually see that, no, my my internet connection is really, really good. I'm get here's here's the bandwidth I'm getting right now. It's actually this one app that is sucking sucking down every single resource of my uh, of my system. It's nice because it's also nice because in addition to the desktop app, uh, you with during in settings you can flip a few switches and get in a, get a menu bar uh, indicators for pretty much anything you want. So I've got like a CPU load uh, on my as a menu bar. I click on that and I get to see here's all the apps that are running and what the individual load is. You can remote monitor. You can turn that on and, and basically get access to these uh, stats uh, from anywhere else on the network through a web browser. Uh, it's it's just a really really solid app. It's exactly what I was looking for, because app, uh, Apple does give you utilities for monitoring these such uh, such things, but they're kind of wonkish in in design. You it's, it's for people who know what they're looking for and and are real admins. It's not really a consumer sort of product. This it really is a consumer level product. It will tell you as much as you want or as little as you want, uh, and it really is uh, two or three different uh, utilities in one. Nice. I use iStat menus, but this is uh, this. It, 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 you know, you got to do something because Apple provides you a pretty good monitor uh, for yeah. free. The, but uh, this looks pretty sweet. They also. I'm gonna check this developer out. ImageTasks.com. It looks like they have a lot of interesting apps I'd never heard of. How much very, is very pretty apps too? How much um, is I Statistica? It, uh, free uh, free trial. Uh, you, I think to get the pro version is ten dollars. Okay. I think. Fair enough. Again, it's available through the App Store. Yeah. They do a lot of interesting stuff. I, this new developer yeah. to me, uh, Renee Ritchie, pick of the week. So I, you know, it's always impossible to follow Lori Gill uh, on anything. <laughs> I don't even know why I try. I also picked a, a YouTube channel, but this is um, very technology focused. It's a channel called Gerald Undone. There's a lot of really, really talented. Oh, I love this guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he, yeah, he or is this, these people. Um, <laughs> I guess I should say. Yeah, yeah, no, he is like high level nerdery. Like when you like he doesn't just he doesn't review the camera at all. Like he's very different than Philip Bloom will take it out and make a movie or, you know, like, a, a, you know, Peter McKinnon, who will go some form of off road chicanery with it from a helicopter on an ATV, that kind of stuff. He goes into a studio and he runs tests on it. He's like a Nantech. I became aware of him because cameras. of last week's review of the A7S III that you were talking about. Yeah, that yeah. Was, he did a fantastic review of that. This and the, he went and borrowed a monitor to see exactly how many steps of of uh, dynamic range that that camera had, which was phenomenal. And he does the same thing here. Like he shows off. This is for the Canon. Uh, his latest review was the Sony camera, and today's is the R5 and R6. Oh boy! And he shows because they're doing well. He he does cover the overheating for sure, but also they're doing new kinds of interpret like linear like a uh, skip line skipping mm -hmm. for example, and how that affects text when you're. And, and things like uh, like how much it sways when you're moving it, you know, like, like just all those little nitty gritty things that you don't even think about or you don't even see in a normal review where someone will tell you your, their opinion on. He will do the tests and show you like he shows the work. He shows the tests, uh, the equipment, everything, comparisons, super detailed, 
uh, super analytical. And it, by all means, please watch all the fabulous photographers and videographers do their amazing reviews. But if you want to know the details of every little bit about it, which codecs work with which and which don't, and what menus are in the wrong place. He reminds me of like a John Syracuse reviewer for, for camera. Yeah, this is <laughs> great. And just, he does chapters, terrific. which is really yeah. nice. Yeah. 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 Gerald Undone. He also has a lot of instruction things. Like he'll explain to you what the difference is between mirrorless and mirrored and micro four thirds and full frame and how to do – like what all this stuff means. Because a lot of people just don't know what all of this thing – like exposure and all – they just don't know what they mean. And he explains all those terms and I love that. I love his test of the autofocus. It's, it's quite a <laughs> – <laughs> Quite a lot, of, a lot of fun. Well, because some of them vary based on brightness. Like right. the previous Sony's, uh, they weren't, or Canon's, I forget which one, was no good when the brightness levels changed. So like, so a lot of the stuff is, this is important pretty quick. daily use. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah well, I'll have to read this. Uh, you know, I'm, of course, drooling at both the R5 and the S3, so I don't know. So can I, can I tell you what I'm going to do, Leo? What are you going to do? Both? Because I have Canon glass and it breaks my heart, but this is not, this is a, if you're a photographer, this is a phenomenal camera. If you're a videographer, it is not. So I think I'm going to bite the bullet and I have a, C, a C500 Mark II for my main camera, but I think I'm going to get the Sony for B-roll and run and gun because it just, it's a better camera for video. It's not a still camera. It's a video camera. Yeah. yeah. I have the old A7S. I also have A7Rs. I have glass for both Canon and Sony. I'm embarrassed to admit. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Mean, that's your business. Like all these all these camera reviewers have the same I just thing. wish I bet I mean, we're a better just... photographer because it's a shame. <laughs> it's wasted on me. Um, oh, and can I mention one last thing? The yeah. new betas are out. And uh, in the mm -hmm. latest beta for Mac, Mac OS Big Sur, Apple, another finally, has added support for 4K HDR YouTube Ooh. on Safari. <laughs> Our long national nightmare is over. All right. <laughs> My pick of the week is going to blow your mind. Here I am using a Lenovo all-in-one running uh, Pop OS Linux. Show my screen. That's fine. And watch as I launch something I just downloaded. It's a... Uh, you could turn up the oh, sound. yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Mac OS 8 running on my Linux box. You could also run it on a Mac if you want. Or uh, And by the way... Did that seem like a fast boot to you? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mac OS 8 actually runs better. Here's Oregon Trail. Or would you rather do, let's do Duke Nukem. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> All right. Can only run in 256 color mode. Let's do that right now. Here we go. The Duke Nukem 3D. This is, <laughs> believe it or not, it's running in Electron, which is hysterical. That just shows you how fast modern computers are compared to... Uh, the old computers that ran this stuff. What's my audio sound like, John? Is it not? Uh, is, it, is it not working? Yeah, I heard a beep, but you didn't hear anything else. Let's rock. Now I'm there hearing it. There we go. It. Damn, <laughs> alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. It's interlaced for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on there. All right, that's Duke Nukem. Let's see what version of Mac OS this is. Oh, look, I've got all the. Remember the. Remember these, what do they call these, desktop uh, desk accessories? Remember these? Remember Notepad? <laughs> wow, I can wow. run Notepad and Duke Nukem at the same time. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Simple and sound. And a calculator. And, the cal and stickies. Oh, What's man. The <laughs> this is pretty hysterical, isn't it? Let's just yeah. quit out of that. We'll quit out of Duke Nukem. And uh, there we go. Beep. Beep. <laughs> Buy the Atomic Edition. I will next time. Uh, simple Sound has quit because an error typed well. Well, that's pretty good. That's all right. At least the computer's still running. This is uh, a Macintosh with 256 megs of built in memory, no virtual memory. 256 megs. Megs. <laughs> megs. And running Mac OS 8.1. Pretty snappy. Pretty nicely <laughs> done. This, this is why I've never been, like, really interested in, like, re reassembling a, a fully functioning, like, Mac Plus system or Mac LC system because, like, the emulators are so damn good and you don't have to – you never have to figure out, okay, where do I find, like, an adapter for this floppy? This is pretty amazing that it's running – It's all through JavaScript, isn't it? In Electron. Yeah, it's JavaScript, yep. believe it or not. Yep. Uh, this is the uh, website Felix Riesenberg, Macintosh.js. It's on GitHub. It's a free download you can uh, play with it, and it runs on Windows, Mac OS, and yes, it runs on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so from now on, uh, when I show any of the uh, 
you know, Mac app picks and stuff, I could just, uh, I'll use this. Everything I do will be for <laughs> Mac OS 8, I'm sorry to say. No, actually, what it was, <laughs> System 8. They didn't call it Mac OS. System 8. And this is JavaScript. That's pretty impressive. Well done, Felix. Uh, that concludes this thrilling, gripping edition of Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie is on the YouTube. He's a YouTube <laughs> star. In fact, check no. out his new review of the IMAX just went up uh, today. That's at youtube.com slash Renee Richie, anything it's not, else? It's not a review yet. It's, it's something new that I tried. I basically turned on two cameras, sat down, opened up the press release, <laughs> and reacted. Oh, uh, it's a reaction and you'll, you'll video. You'll notice when it says, like, 1080p camera, I'm like, Wah! and no more hard <laughs> HDDs. Woo! I mean, it's not quite It's not, It's not. not quite that level, but it really was. I wanted to try something more like what we do on Mac Break. Which sounds is like fun. Talk to people. Yeah, hot yeah. takes. Yeah. Renee yeah. Ritchie, hot takes, so take hot. one. So, so hot. Uh, Lori Gill is managing editor at iMore.com. She's on the Twitter at Appaholic. Great to have you, Lori, as always. Thank you. Andy Anaka, when are you going to be on GBH next? Uh, looks like Friday at 1 p.m. Go to gbhnews.org. Thank you very much. I-H-N-A-T-K-O.com. I will be back here tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. <laughs> Pacific. Hi, Leo. Whatever is happening. Uh, I don't know. Nothing I care about. Are you getting unpacked? I'm getting unpacked with Samsung. We're going to oh, unpack. Oh, you fold out? Yeah. <laughs> it's really, actually, I'm really, it, Samsung's going to show his new Note 20, its new Galaxy Fold, uh, new watch, new I'm tablet. I'm really angry. I don't want to spend that money, but it looks terrific. Like, that is an expensive, expensive phone, but it the looks terrific. The Fold or the yeah. Note 20? Which? The, the, fo the, the Fold. I mean, I'm newly unemployed, yeah. and that phone looks way too good. Well, I may much. buy it for you because uh, I feel like we should have a Fold in-house, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> you See, think that's, it's going to be good this time? That's, yeah, well, see, that's the problem. I was about to say that's the problem with Samsung. Like we always oh, yes. <laughs> look how look how all of the review units are disaster. <laughs> and then like two generations later, you're like, holy mother of God, I want that. <laughs> it's time to look at it. It's there's no I'm point. With, I'm with you Renee. in buying a 5G phone for me. I'll never get that. But anyway, we'll watch together. Jason Howell and I will be streaming live. The event begins 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. And uh, you can tune it in at twit.tv slash live or catch our, catch our commentary after the fact on our website. That's the same place you'll find this show. We do Mac Break Weekly. We try, but it's hard. But sometime in the, in the morning, <laughs> usually, sometimes before <laughs> noon, sometimes afternoon, sometimes, but it's on a Tuesday. That's I can, I can promise you that. <laughs> Theoretically, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1800 UTC. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time. It, thing is it's ios today before that i know you're interested in that too tune in it all starts 9 a.m pacific the stream is uh, live at twit.tv slash live there's audio and video there on demand episodes of every show we do are on our website twit.tv for macbreak weekly it's twit.tv slash mbw you can also get it on uh, your voice enabled device just ask hey echo play macbreak weekly on tune in or Something like that. It'll play the most recent episode. Sometimes you say Mac Break Weekly Podcast. That's enough. I, you know, the syntax seems to vary all the time. We also uh, are on uh, YouTube. There's a YouTube feed for all the Mac Break Weekly shows. Best thing to do would be get a podcast application and subscribe. That way you'll get it automatically uh, the minute it's available of a Tuesday evening. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you all for joining us. Now get back to work, cuz break time is over. Bye-bye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. Got a question for you. Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more.